here we go in three two one here we are tonight is a very special edition of the jeremy white podcast alongside rock talk with mitch lafon this is so weird usually i'm in the studio and stuff it's a casual fireside chat tonight with one of the most legendary guys of the road he's listen he's held every single guitar that you could possibly imagine for some of the biggest names in showbiz and we're going to get into the history we'll talk all about that stuff but this man is just full of knowledge he's like the encyclopedia of being on the road so we're very and guitars stuff. and guitars the encyclopedia i mean you know he builds, Dude. Dude. builds. yeah it's nuts everybody th there's tom weber everybody say hi what's up tom hi everybody good to be with you Good day, Tom. Yeah, well, and we'll get into that because uh, I've been reading up on you and checking oh. the facts. And you started at fourteen, taking yeah. an old Gibson guitar and fixing it, and then you went to Gibson. And they went, "Yeah, it's actually pretty good." <laughs> yeah. Nice job. It was. Uh, it was quite. Uh, that was the moment that changed my life. You know that it was kind of kind of scary because when we took it to, took it to Gibson, my my father and I, uh, old guy comes out. He's literally wearing a straw hat and a string tie like a bolo tie and the the clasp on it was a pedal steel and nice. he's looking the guitar over and he literally puts the thing over his knee and tr and gives it a good shove like he's trying to break it again and <laughs> trying like, to prove the kid's a fake right going yeah all right go on and i'm 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 about ready to have a heart attack at 14 years old because my you know i'd put so much work into this thing it was a, it was a Gibson SG and it had been broken in four pieces when I found it in a yard sale and glued it all back together, painted it black, inlaid a bunch of uh, um, mother of pearl and abalone flowers and vines around one, uh, one edge of it. And this guy's got it over his knee trying to see if it's going to snap in half. And like, and that's really just mean, you know, you, you're, you got a 14 year old. Yeah, but some, you know, listen, that one, that must have been back, what, like in the 60s or 50s. They, you know, they, they used to teach kid lessons, right? You know, you have oh, to yeah. teach them a lesson. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, and I, I learned a lot. I learned you know, a lot. I Jeremy's from the soft marshmallow thing where everybody gets a participation trophy. We're from that old school where they tried to teach you shit. Yeah, you, you know. have to do something. Yeah. <laughs> you have to prove your work. So. Hey, before we get on to uh, to the to the GoFundMe and, and all the uh, the Van Halen stuff, just real quick, where did you learn that? Because at fourteen, uh, listen, I, I put baseball cards in my spokes and I called it, uh, you know, <laughs> engineering. So, there you so, go. so, so, where did you learn to rebuild a guitar? I mean, you didn't just pick it up and go. All right, I'm just going to go. I mean, was your dad in, into technology? Well, my uh, my father was an aerospace engineer. Um, he was not a woodworker of any kind. So, you know, the, the guitar end of it ended up being, that was up to me. Um, I started playing guitar when I was, oh, I think I, you know, I got my first guitar guitar when I was five. And uh, I think I'm losing your, I think I'm losing your, your. No, we're still here. I got no. you. Yeah. I didn't have audio there for a second. Yeah. Oh, it's because we both muted our audio so that we let you have the floor. There we uh, go. Yeah, I see. It's, it's called now? it's called respect. Yeah. Uh, Speaking no, of, no, hold no, on. Uh, Greg Greg Rule really just joined the. Um, oh, bring in Greg for a second. Greg, Greg, Rule, for, yeah. bring in Greg. Hold on, and hold then on. we're gonna we're gonna get this uh, we're gonna get this going. Here, here, look at that. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. Greg Rule. Uh, Connecting audio. I don't, I don't see him. He's coming. He's coming. He's, hold on, Greg is. Not, oh, Greg did not connect to audio. Greg, are you there? Greg, don't you aren't you don't you run playback for a living? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, audio. Oh. Hold on, he's his. Your audio is on mute, Greg. Oh, hello, there one, two, one, there two. There you go. Hey. <laughs> so, hey, so we've got uh, two. Uh, do we just call you roadies? Is that the, is that the proper term or is that? Uh, yeah, is that like a derogatory? We'll call them or entertainment technicians. Uh, f formerly with Van Halen, Greg, of course, with a foreigner. Uh, bonjour, Greg. Bonjour, Tom. I'll let you two say hello to each other since it's been a while. Greg, Tom Weber here. How are you, my brother? Tom, good to see you, man. Uh, oh, there you are. Yeah, good to That's see you, Tom. It's been a while. Five, five years, five and a half years. 
Yeah, no doubt. Uh, no doubt. Too damn long. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so here, let's, since, since we got both of you here, because there is a sort of serious problem when we talk about save the stages and this and that, we're, we're very focused on the venues. We're very focused on the businesses. We're even somewhat focused on the artists. We're not focused on you. So right. <laughs> we're not. And, and that's not, I mean, it's not my fault, but I mean, the industry keeps talking about let's save this building and let's save that building and let's save this bar owner and let's save flight that bar owner. The poor flight attendants. Oh, the airlines, they're going, they're going bankrupt. But, but they're not talking about you guys. Um, let's, let's just get into that. What, what is the situation? You know, you, you didn't get paid for a year. Are you eligible for, for unemployment insurance or employment insurance as we call it in Canada? Are you eligible for any kind of financial aid? In most cases, no. Um, you know, we were coming off of that. The, you kind of want to take a look at, at what we do for a living as mm -hmm. seasonal work for some. Um, there are those that are fortunate enough to work, you know, end to end to end, you know, one tour to another. Right. Um, but there's a lot of guys that, you know, when the concert season is over, they go home and they try to figure out how to make the money last. Right. And, you know, there, there's been a big, at, at one point in time, we were, we were all 1099s, uh, you know, employees, self-employed contractors. And then uh, a number of years ago, there was a big push to make everybody employees. Well, that's great when it comes time for unemployment, but, you know, you get to the end of a season and you're starting to work your way through the first part of the next year and looking forward to getting back to rehearsal and getting shows on the road. So you've been on unemployment at that point in time in a lot of cases. So when this whole thing hit, a lot of guys were at the end of their eligibility for unemployment. Oh. And, you know, you start talking about, well, the, the PPP loans and the PUA and the this and the that and the other thing. Well, you know, most of us aren't eligible for any of that kind of thing. And, you know, we're kind of, we're hung out to dry uh, at this point. And I, I said to somebody uh, uh, just the other day that we spend, we spend our lives, you know, we dress in black and we, we blend into the dark places on the stage so that people don't see us unless it's absolutely necessary. And I think the byproduct of that is the idea that, a lot of people don't even realize that we exist. You know, they come to a show and they have a great time and they go home and they talk about how much fun they had all the way home, but they really don't know how the show gets to be a show and what happens, you know, what happens when it's over. Uh, it's or organized chaos, getting everything back in trucks and getting to the next show the next day. And most people don't realize that. And if they don't know that we exist, how would they know that we're in this situation? And, yeah. uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's happening to hundreds of thousands of people in this country uh, and, and millions around the world. You know, we're unrecognized and, and uh, uh, you know, just... Yeah, just, just, to, just ignore and and yeah. uh, Greg, just for you for a second, you're, you've been lucky enough to be in an organization like Foreigner where they have had merch sales and other stuff where they've tried. Now, I don't know how successful it's been. I don't know, how, you know, but they've tried at least, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, as Tom was saying, most people out on the road, you're going from project to project. I mean, that was the, the start of my career. And it's feast or famine. You'll have an amazing tour with an artist and then it all shuts down. Uh, and then you're scrambling what comes next. And if you're lucky, maybe something comes quickly. Other times you're waiting for months for the next project and it's feast or famine. Uh, a few people are lucky to find bands like, such as Foreigner that uh, are established enough to where they're, I equate it to like a sports franchise. They have a season. They have a goal every year of doing a set number of shows. They take their holidays off, et cetera. And it's a little bit of a different category. A lot of the classic rockers uh, fall into that now, thankfully. But I would say that's a, a slim percentage of most touring people that are out there 
just um, going from project to project, living from paycheck to paycheck. Uh, the foreigner camp was an amazing story. Indeed, they uh, they had a crew merch campaign, which was awesome. Um, you know, I'm how do I say it, it's a drop in the bucket as, as, as far as um, what we what a year looks right. like. Right. Yeah. I mean, Hopefully. but at least they're uh, trying because others just they either yeah. haven't tried or they just they just can't. It's, it's just it's not feasible because they're not at oh, that level. Absolutely. And, you know, we're all extremely grateful and, and really touched by the campaign and uh, every little dollar and effort uh, helps. Absolutely. Yeah. And even if they're just selling, you know, a couple of limited edition T-shirts, you know, it's the same. Like, you know, Def Leppard did the same thing for their crew. They were actually selling, you know, mock-up local crew 2020 shirts from the stadium tour. And I bought a couple. I gave Mitch one of them. And I was like, you know, it's kind of cool. But at the same time, I'm like, you know, there's no way with the amount of T-shirts that they're selling could ever make up for what the crew would actually be losing from that tour. There's no way. So either way, you're hurting. Yeah. Yep, that's very true. <laughs> And, and uh, so let, let me just get to, to you, Tom, for a second. You've got this GoFundMe uh, set up. What is the actual page here? Because we'll, we'll, we'll display it after that. But, but it's GoFundMe forward slash what? You got me. I, okay, well, I'll, I'll go I find it. I'm going to pull it up I right now. Set Hold it, on. Up. It, was, no. uh, it was set up for me by a lady named Sandy Espinoza. Um, we'll, fi we'll find it. So, so let, just talk to me about that story because you had... Uh, well, you told me previously you had bought all this gear, like oh, like fifty thousand dollars worth of gear, in anticipation of going out with Reba McIntyre, and I believe Poison. Right. And then, well, then the, my my schedule for my schedule for twenty twenty was going to be the the busiest schedule that I'd ever had. Um, literally going from um, the last day of the the first leg of a Reba tour into the Motley Crue, Def Leppard, Poison stadium tour the very next day. Well, you can't send an 800 pound work box full of tools overnight to another tour. And on that, on that tour, there were supposed to be the stadium dates and then Poison had headline shows, you know, where the gear may or may not get back. So I basically had to duplicate um, with all the things that were going on for the year, I was going to be home a month and a half this year or last year and had to have enough tools to go around. So, you know, I thought I'm looking at a, I'm looking at a huge year. Um, it's all written in stone. Everybody's on board. I can go ahead and do this. So I went and spent the money on road cases and multiple tools and, you know, it's I've got forty six, forty seven thousand dollars worth of road cases and tools that I bought for twenty twenty, and oh my I'm, god, that is a lot of gear. It's really not. It's no? expensive to be. You know, it's expensive to to have your own tools and be a a, a tech. You know, yeah. And, and it's the stadium tour. It's not. It's not the whatever L.A. Guns bar tour. You know, right. no offense, you know, by the way. <laughs> it's it's serious business when you know when you get to a point like uh, where where Greg and I are. Um, it's it's very flattering to know that people depend on you to be able to do whatever needs to be done, but it requires the ability and the tooling to be able to accomplish what they expect, and I'm kind of known for having like. My, my work box is affectionately known as Walmart because there's so <laughs> anything that you could possibly want is in there for me to do my job. And I, you know, I had to, I had to put together, you know, three complete different setups this year. And I thought I'll bite the bullet. I mean, you know, I'm making more than enough money this year. Everything's going to be good. Sure. We're coming off of a slow year in 2019. Um, but I had the money to put into it, figuring I'd get it back. And then COVID hit, you know, I'm, I'm two and a half weeks into rehearsal with Reba McIntyre and looking at a banner year. And the next day we go home and now I've got all of these tools and stuff. And it's like, okay, that's just an example of one thing that's put me behind the eight ball. You know, I had uh, a couple of years ago for 26 years previous, I had one of the largest, if not the largest uh, guitar repair facility in the United States. And after 26 years in the building, they sold the building 
the new landlords were like, you know, we we want to, we, we're not going to change your rent. We don't want you to leave. You know, maybe we can invest in what you're doing and uh, uh, you can come home and live your life, uh, you know, and, and live your dream in this shop. And that lasted until 48 hours after they took possession of the building and sent me the, 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 the only concrete thing. They sent me the first email saying you've got 30 days to go from 17 and a half thousand square feet down to 4,000 square feet. What and I had, fuck? well, there's that. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. But I had a week and a half before I had to be in Japan with Journey at the time and uh, couldn't sell, couldn't move. I moved all of the very most important stuff into the 4,000 square feet and donated the rest to charity. Um, you know, we watched, we watched 18 tractor trailers full of my stuff go to charity. And I thought, okay, now I get on an airplane and I go do a month in, in Asia, come back. And the next day I get an email saying, well, you know, we've decided that that 4,000 square feet is now worth $9,000 a month. And, you know, considering you're the only, uh, you're the only tenant left in the 44,000 square foot building, you get to pay all the building maintenance too, which. What? How, how yeah. do it? Oh, well, this is it? this is like some Judge Judy shit right here. Oh yeah, yeah, and you know that include that includes the gas bill, which for the boiler for a forty-four thousand square foot building in January, that bill was thirty-six thousand dollars, and they expect me to pay that. You know, basically what they were trying to do was to force me into an eviction situation so that they could just take everything that I own, and I got the guy to admit it. You know, it's like. We, you know, after that, I kept the very best stuff and put it in storage spaces where I could find them. We scrapped 10 and a half tons of machinery and, and fixtures. And I watched eight 20 yard dumpsters in my personal property go to a landfill because there's no place to put it, you know. And it's, it is what it is. You know, so, I, I, I realized that I don't need all that stuff. But, you know, we used to, at one point in time, my shop was the BC Rich Handmade Shop. You know, we could build large numbers of high quality guitars in there. And that's what I had been building the place to be, you know, for 26 years. So I had some place to come home to. Now I don't. And now I'm home. And I've just been informed that one of the buildings that I store things in has been sold as well. So now I'm looking down the barrel of having to move, you know, 4,000 square feet of stuff out of that building with zero money coming in the door. And right, and, and you that, were telling me that, according to you, you don't think we're gonna see tours of this nature till 2024, you said, not even 2022, you said 2024 to me. Yeah, the, the, the people that I've been talking with, um, we've pretty much come to the, you know, the concept, the concept as we understand it is, there isn't going to be a tour until there's an insurance company that's willing to underwrite one. Right. Cause um, tour insurance is a major part of yeah, getting oh shows God. on the road. Well, yeah, hold on, Tom, Tom, let me ask you this. You know, we're, we're talking about tour insurance and stuff. When a tour gets booked like that, don't they take into consideration, you know, like is the event that, you know, a show gets canceled or, you know, an act of God preventing something from going on. Like, wouldn't that tour insurance take care of you guys? Well, before just, COVID, but now they're going to rewrite them. That's the difference, right, though. Right. See, the problem that you have here, it isn't like somebody, it isn't like somebody that goes to a concert, maybe trips and sprains their right. ankle. Mm -hmm. Well, it's known versus unknown. And before right. it's unknown. And now this is known. COVID is known. Right. So I mean, insurance companies if, are like. If you have 25,000 people, you know, at an, at an outdoor venue and somebody coughs, you know, nobody's going to be able to prove where they got COVID, but if you have 25,000 people at, at a venue and 5,000 of them get sick the next week and mm -hmm. they all decide to sue the production, it doesn't matter if they win because unless it's a class action lawsuit, you're going to have 5,000 people sue you and you have to go to court or you have to be represented in court every single time. 5,000 times. You yeah. now have to, you're now looking at attorney fees that will just wipe out anything that you could possibly make so no insurance company is going to going to underwrite one of these things until there's a proven vaccine 
Yeah. Now, how long, you know, we have a, we have uh, several vaccines, but the proof that it works, it could be two years or more before there's, there's enough evidence for an insurance to com a company to say, okay, we're comfortable with this, you know, live entertainment can, can be yeah. a thing again. Well, you know, we'll all, we'll all be dead by then. You know, <laughs> I'm going to be standing, I'll, I'll be standing on a street corner with a sign that says, we'll tune guitars for food. Right, right. He, he's 26. He'll be around. But the, the other three, oh, yeah. may, I don't know. Yeah. Well, listen, I, want, I want to talk about I want to talk about the 2015 Van Halen tour that you guys did together. But before we get there, so it's Tom Weber needs help to save his home. That's the goal true page. So it's, um, it's very easy to find. Just GoFundMe.com and type in Tom Weber needs help to save his home and you'll find it up there. It's also been posted in a bunch of uh, Van Halen Facebook groups, Facebook right. groups and it's in like the uh, EVH gear, uh, Ernie Ball, Music Man, PV Wolfgang, uh, Facebook group. They're all in there. So yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll get and, that. And we'll get that posted. We'll get the we'll get that all posted up there, too. So but awesome. you know, Greg and Tom, you guys work together. And did you guys tour like doing Van Halen stuff? before the 2015 tour or was that like the the first tour you guys worked together on or have you guys toured together before yeah have you done reba mcintyre no. or did bob Seeger like, together Europe together or like no that that was the first first time that greg and i were in this in the same same camp together and and doggone it i wish we could do it again because yeah he, he he's he's a lot of fun for a quiet guy you know <laughs> well, he's on mute right now, and he—he he, he looks like a mime laughing. <laughs> so maybe that's why I think he's quiet. He's on mute all the time. Yeah. So, Greg, yeah, let me ask you this: You know, so your main job on that 2015 Van Halen tour was, you know, as the playback engineer, basically, right? So, what does that entail? Like, do you have to go to rehearsals and you dial in? You know, like, uh, like, are you working, you know, with the band and figuring out, okay, I'm going to trigger, you know, like the track here. Because you know, I want to talk. Were you were you there when that whole like screw up happened with the sample rate of the keyboard in like two thousand eight or whatever it was? Tom, okay. you were there. Oh yeah. All right. Hold okay. on. Let's hear. Let's hear that. Okay. It's not the keyboard sample rate. Oh, okay. It has nothing to do with the keyboards. Okay? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Do I tell. Haven't been, I haven't been able to address this because mm -hmm. it's a sore spot for Ed. Okay. Oh. So basically what we have here is a situation where I don't remember where we were, uh, Greensboro, maybe uh, somewhere uh, like that, something like that. And uh, during the guitar solo, which was a couple of songs before the infamous incident, mm -hmm. um, Ed loves to make noises with the guitar. We all know that you know, anybody that's been to a Van Halen show and been there for the, the guitar solo knows that you're liable to hear any unearthly sound that Ed can make with a guitar. Yeah. So at one point, he took the guitar and literally jammed the headstock of the neck into the stage several times. I remember him doing that on a bunch of a bunch of dates because he was okay. testing out he was testing out the Wolfgang, like the new Wolfgang on that tour, right? right? So right. in Montreal, I remember seeing him. He was there, like, you know, he had the thing and he was almost like banging it, like, you know, like into the stage. Right, right. Like a shovel. Now, normally, normally, if there was a situation where the guitar was out of tune, obviously my job is to be ready for him with another guitar, mm -hmm. which I was because Ed's right hand guy, Matt Bruck, and I were in Guitar World and it's like, oh, crap. He's knocked the guitar out of tune. Well, he fine tunes it some, you know, and, and gets back into playing. And I'm holding, a, I'm holding another guitar over my head so that he can see it. And, and he's waving it off. Mm. And it's like, okay, well, you know, he's still playing the solo. He's fine tuned. It's passable. Okay. Well, they go right from, they go right from that into Ain't Talking About Love. That's the next song on the set list. And Wolfgang starts playing and realizes that he's not in tune with the guitar. So he retunes a little bit. The next couple oh, of songs, yeah, so they're in tune. You have guitar and yeah. bass in tune. So they play Ain't Talking About Love and Panama. And then typically the band, at the end of the show, they come off stage for, for a minute. I switch guitars with Ed. 
and they go back on for the encore, which is jump. That night, they didn't come off stage. They went around the corner of the, of the, uh, the we had what we called the phone booth on stage left, the, the big ego ramp that went up around to this big cabinet that nobody ever used for anything. Uh -huh. But they went around the side of that and Ed didn't come off the stage to get another guitar. Oh. So now you have, now you have Wolfgang on his bass and Ed with his out of tune guitar on a keyboard song that is in tune. So, and Ed doesn't, didn't have keyboards in his monitor mix. So he didn't hear that oh. he was on a tune. So you, that's where that all went. Oh, and of course, man. the funniest part about it was a couple, he didn't know that that had happened until a couple of weeks later when somebody was at the venue and showed him the video of it. So I got, I got called to the dressing room full of people. And he said, you handed me an out of tune guitar. I said, no, I didn't. I said, if, if, you'll re if you'll recall, I said, you, you banged the headstock of the guitar into the stage that night several times. And then you didn't come off the stage to get a, 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 the, the guitar at the end of the show for the encore. Uh, and he said, oh, that wouldn't make any difference. And he proceeded, he had the guitar around his neck and he proceeded to jam it into the dressing room floor and, and it comes back up and, you know, in front of a room full of people, it comes back up and it's like, it's way out of time. Oh man. <laughs> I said, just saying, and that's the last I ever heard of it. So, wow. We made, we made at that point, I, I made, uh, I made the suggestion that every night, being that that Jump was the most iconic radio song that, that Van Halen had, and that the, the Frankenstein guitar was the most iconic guitar of that era for him, that we should switch to that guitar every night for the encore. Right. And that's it, the way it went every night from that night forward. And wow. That's, a, that's such an incredible story. Well, it's you know what's amazing, guys, about that whole thing that yeah. kind of went that situation went viral mm -hmm. in the music industry anyway. Yep. If anyone had taken the time to just compare YouTube videos from that tour, I think that was like you said, Tom Greensboro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you up that night on YouTube, then watch a show the week earlier, the week after. It's the keyboards are the same tuning. It's the same keyboard, yeah. Even if you go oh, to yeah. the night, but night, yeah. the next night, it would have been the same uh, thing. The sample rate never changed, and no. so uh, that's a pretty sad story. Yeah, and the and the, the the part for me is, you know, I couldn't draw attention to what actually happened. So forever and ever and ever, it was either it was either the keyboard guy or me. Mm -hmm. One of us, one of us screwed up according to what everybody else said and yeah. nobody else nobody came out i couldn't come out and say anything about what actually happened until right now so but I'm it's surprised like that you know nobody in the moment like you know got on like the talk back i was like guys okay we got to stop we got to stop there's something going on something going on like you know it just came out like just bring it to a halt and keep going like the band just powered through it like as if nothing was wrong that's what yeah. you do in shows you just you, guess, you, work, play, yeah. you play through mistakes because they happen all the time yeah, you, know, you know, and that's that's yeah. that's where the importance of of your monitor mix comes in because Ed had no way of knowing. As yeah. loud as his guitar is, where he was standing at the time, there would have been no way that he would have heard the the the, the keyboard being in a different tune. But even Wolf, you know, being on bass, like, and if he t tuned down to match Ed. Like, wouldn't have he heard in his in his in ears? Like, oh shit! I, even I'm out of tune with the keyboard. Like, they did. They don't. They didn't use in ears. Oh, on that tour, they didn't have any. Alex was the only one with in ears on that tour. See, the yeah. thing the thing about it was, for the last song, Wolfgang made his bass change, and probably anticipated that Ed was going to make a guitar change as well, and everything would be back to normal. Oh, yeah. Okay. Keyboard song, and it didn't quite happen that way. Oh, so, that's incredible. All right, so Greg, then, Greg, were you running the keyboard that night? No, that's 2008, so he didn't get on for another seven years. 
Yeah. But but the one yeah. story I want to hear, Greg, you talk about the insects. This uh, in, in, in <laughs> tell tell me about the insects, and I and I don't have my the city in front of me. Where was that again? Cincinnati or something? Where, where are the Kansas City? The Kansas, Kansas City Kansas insect. City. All right. So let's hear about the infamous Kansas City insect incident. Let's hear about this. Yeah, this made CNN headline news the next day, and Tom was in the middle of it. So Tom, take it away. <laughs> Well, I don't remember what song they were playing, but all of a sudden this monster bug uh, is is flying around Ed's head. And I mean, we're talking of, you know, a huge. It's like a hummingbird. <laughs> yeah, it was about that size. And Ed tried, you know, you can see him. Uh, there's video of it. You can see him batting it away. And and it, it lands, you know, on, it lands near his pedal board. And he's trying to kick it away and it won't go away. And finally, he calls me out on stage after the song. He's telling everybody in the audience, you know, there's this, this airplane-sized bug, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, dive-bombing me here. And he calls me out on stage. He says, you know, Tom, come on, come on here and take a picture of this. You know, in front of a sold-out show, you know, sold-out crowd, he, I get called out with my phone to take pictures of this thing. And and I still have it. It's, it's still on my phone. It showed up... Uh, I think I think Jim Service uh, uh, had got into a conversation with it uh, with somebody about it on Facebook, and I've sent the picture. And I said, "You mean this bug?" And it, it, I mean, this. Somebody said, I, "I don't remember what they 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 said it was an assassin bug, which evidently you don't want to get bitten by one because it it really hurts for a while. You know, I'm I'm glad it didn't bite Ed, and I'm really glad it didn't bite me, but you know, it was kind of a, a comical moment on that uh, on that evening. You know, Tom, I remember when that happened. That whole night was awful. The s bugs were, were swarms of bugs. Oh, was, the band was swarming bugs amazing. all night. Wolf was really creeped out by it. He kept coming off stage and it was very <laughs> distracting. So when that whole thing happened, uh, Jim Service and I were over on stage right and we saw the commotion going on and we thought, oh no, something's Something's happened with Ed's rig. Tom's on stage. Uh oh, and all the all the stuff going on. But I remember Ed getting on mic finally and saying to the audience, "I think his words were, I'm sorry, but there's a big ass bug yeah, right here. Yeah. Check this out. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> big ass fucking bug. That's what he said. That's right. Yeah." <laughs> And you see him sort of like go and run and like kick the thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah. Like, it Is there was any not, other was, crazy he... stories like that where like, you know, the band gets attacked on stage by bugs or pack of wild dogs? <laughs> oh, yeah. It happens all the time. It happens all the time. But, uh, you know, I, was, I, I, I always thought that if I ever bumped into Ed again, the first thing would be, remember that night in Kansas City? <laughs> <laughs> and he would too he would he, he would have just shaken his head like holy crap you remember that that big ass fucking bug <laughs> it would have been funnier if they kicked into playing the full bug that would have made sense oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> it's, oh dude oh mitch is talking we can't hear you it, it helps if i actually unmute myself I, I was just saying if you go to google it's funny you put in Van Halen bug Kansas City and a whole page of pictures and video links. <laughs> it is it is definitely infamous. Um, hey, Mitch, uh, let, let me tell you, let me share one thing before I forget. Yeah. Just getting back to the whole top of this uh, 2015 tour, you know, that was my first time coming into Van Halen camp. I wish I'd been there with Tom on that 08 tour, but uh, I think I was with the Eagles then. But anyway, that fate led me to Van Halen uh, for that go around. I'll, here's my one of my favorite stories from that whole experience. The day I got called up to Ed's house, this was kind of in pre-production, and so me sort of having the you know the keyboard tracks and being in the band, but not really on those songs. It was important <laughs> for me to come up to Ed's house with the computers so that they could practice the. The keyboard songs and so here i am at 5150 and i'm over in the corner it's uh, ed wolf and alex no dave 
and uh, just going to run the keyboard songs. So I'm on my way up there for the first time ever. And I'm thinking, wow, I don't know what to expect. This could go, be quick. I could be there all day. I'm going to pull into the grocery store a mile from Ed's place and just get a bottle of water, maybe a power bar or something. And just in case I'm kind of stuck in the studio all day, I don't want to be out expecting food or I don't know what Starving. can happen. So hey, Ed, when are you going to be making burgers? Could you, could you help out? <laughs> so I get up Ed, there. The pizza? <laughs> so I get up there that day and here I am. It's just, you know, pinch me. I'm looking around. I can't believe I'm here. It's, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So before I get up there, I go to the grocery store and I'm in, I'm in line at Ralph's grocery store and I'm thinking to myself, here I am a mile away from Eddie Van Halen's home. What are the chances that he comes down the hill and buys his own groceries here at this grocery store? I'm sure he doesn't. And I'm not kidding you. The minute that thought pops into my head, guess who comes walking toward me in the grocery store? <laughs> Eddie Van Halen. Oh, Ed. <laughs> awesome. That's great. So That's that great. Was, that was kind of my day one story there was it like hey greg what's up you coming to my house do you need anything <laughs> so anyway question answered yes he comes down the hill and buys his own yeah that's <laughs> awesome <laughs> that's cool so yeah. day, day, day one uh day one for me i get the call you know there, there's been this they've gone through three just, just, just before that who were you with before you got the call like who were you was it bob seeger was it was it fleawood mac no. was it the eagles I hadn't, Who worked, was, I hadn't worked with Bob in, in, in years and years okay. and years. At that so point. when you got the Van Halen call, you were leaving what or coming from what? I was coming off of poison at that point. Mm. And nice. We like it, the poison. It was hilarious because I'm, I, you know, I was riding on the, on, on CC DeVille's bus on that tour. And uh, I, I got the call and uh, to, to come out and they wanted to interview me. And CC and I were talking about it when, after I hung up the phone. And in his inimitable fashion, he says, Tom Weber, if you pull this off, next year you'll be able to tell him what color bus you want to ride on. <laughs> and it's just my, I, I've always said, Ed's my boss, CC's my boy. Nice. And that's, that's pretty much it. But, you know, my, <clears throat> Getting back to first days with Van Halen, I, I oh, wait. Guess, hold on, Tom. Don't don't talk about that. that now I want to know. You got you had a job interview. So how does the job interview with Eddie Van Halen go? Well, that's that's. Go, where go ahead going. and string this guitar. Good. All right. Good. Can I wipe this one <laughs> I, down? All right. Good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. Well, I <laughs> I I flew out to L.A. and Matt Brock, who I'm sure you guys know of, Matt. Yeah. Um, Matt. Uh, I, I took a I took a, uh, uh, a cab to the Sportsman's Lodge and got checked in, and Matt picked me up, and we went to fifty one right across the street from that Ralph's, by the way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we love Ralph's; it's a great store. Yeah. I've been often. And we uh, we go to fifty one fifty and and walk in, and Matt takes a guitar out of a gig bag and he hands it to me, and he said you're to set this up the way you think Ed would like it. And I'm to give you absolutely no information to go by. What? <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay. And we put a blindfold a on you. Go. Yeah. No, nothing, <laughs> and the lights are out. Crash, nothing like trial by fire or crash and burn, you know. It's and like, you've got 30 seconds. Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Well, I, I figure, you know, if this was easy, I wouldn't be here. And I, I know that they're on at least their third guy in production rehearsal. Um, so things aren't going well at this point. So I have to think how far outside the box do I have to make this for it to work for Ed? So I remembered uh, Ed and I met the first time in 1987. I was the house audio engineer at Starwood Amphitheater in Nashville. And we ended up that's a whole nother story, which is really cool, but I digress. Um, I remember, you know, shaking hands with him. He had a really strong grip. So 
you know, you, you, you press the string on the fingerboard, it, it meets the fret, you get the note. If you press really hard, the string meets the fingerboard and the note that you just had is really sharp. So mm -hmm. I figure Ed's got a hell of a left hand. I'm gonna have to set the intonation flat enough so that when he grabs the neck, the notes are right. Well, when you strike a note on a guitar to tune it, the note starts out going sharp and then it settles into pitch. Mm -hmm. Ed Van Halen's not gonna stay in one place long enough for a note to settle into pitch. So as you pick the string, I figured that's got to be the note. He's also a classically trained pianist. So the strings open on the guitar don't mean anything. They have to be in tune with themselves where he's playing for any given song. So I figure first position, fifth position, I'd find I'd temper tune the guitar in the fifth position and then split the difference to, to the first position. And that'd give me kind of a an in-between that he could go to. Now, if you do that, the high, you know, for guitar players, the high E string, or in Ed's case, we tune down a half step. So the high D sharp is literally 14 cents flat. Mm. Which means that if I played one of Ed's guitars, the way that I play my own guitars, I'd sound like a blithering idiot because I'd be so out of tune, it was ridiculous. But I thought, wow. okay, this is as far off center as I can make it. And if it's wrong, I've, I've had a chance to have a shot at working with arguably the greatest guitar player of our time. And it was just an honor to be there. So I get it the way I want it. I walk up to Matt and I hand it back to him. And he says, you done? I said, yeah. And he looked at me, he said, are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Okay. He said, I'll take it up to the house. It'll, it'll play it. He'll say, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Head down he to said, the Ralphs and wait for us there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, you know, it, the funny thing was, is, you know, Matt said, uh, I'll be back in a few minutes. Make yourself at home. I'm in the studio at 5150. I'm going to make myself at home. I sat on my hands for 10 minutes because I'm not touching anything. You know, <laughs> I wanted to. I wanted to just look around. But it's like, that's not happening. Right. So a few minutes go by and Matt walks back in the door with the guitar over his shoulder. And he says, dude, big smiles right out of the box. He said, I've been with Ed for 17 years. He said, you're the closest guy so far. He said, Ed, Ed has told me, he said, nobody in the world, not even me, can tune a guitar for him. And he set the guitar aside. He handed me another one. He, he said, Ed wants you to take this one back to your hotel, wave the magic wand over it. I'll pick you back up at, tomorrow at four o'clock. He wants to know if you're good or if you're lucky. And I came back at four o'clock uh, the next day and uh, Ed came in and you know it, we hadn't seen one another since 1987 or actually 93 was the, the last time that I'd seen him. Mm. And he walks in the door and he looks at me, he goes, I know you. And I said, yes, sir, you do. And he says, I don't remember why I know you, but I know that I know you. And we had a, we had a conversation um, that is also kind of funny, but the, the, as we reached the, 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 the point where he looked over his shoulder and saw the guitar sitting on the bench, he said, is that, is that the one that, that you worked on? And I said, yes, it is. And uh, he went over and he picked it up and he put it up to the neck up to his ear and he played a chord and he said, it's perfect. He said, where have you been all my life? I said, on the other end of the phone, waiting for you to fucking call me. You know? <laughs> Hey Tom, the telephone number since 1987, for Christ's sake, you know. Tom, but, you just reminded me of something. Uh, yeah. Totally forgot about this. The first day I was in the rehearsal studio with Ed, before the uh, the story about Ralph's, he came over to me. We'd ne never met before, and he looks at me and says, "We've met." And I said, "No, no, sir. I don't believe we have." And he he said, "Yes, we've we've met. I know you." Perfect. And I, and I said, wow, I, I believe, sir, I don't believe we've met. He yeah. said, no, we've met. 
And then I started thinking about it and I said, oh, wait a minute. Probably <laughs> 15 years earlier, I was backstage at the Cow Palace with Alex. There you go. And Ed came into the dressing room and just briefly, we, I was playing Alex the Buddy Rich drum tapes. Oh, nice. And Ed comes in, he's like, come over here, you gotta listen to this with me. And they were laughing and then Ed left. And I thought to myself, is it possible he, he could remember me from that one brief Absolutely. encounter all those years ago? It blew my mind. <laughs> that was the only ex explanation. There are people like that. You know, uh, the, I think the most impressive one for me, uh, I worked in a music store as a, a kid and a friend of the owner used to play guitar with B.B. King back like a long, long time ago. And they came to the store one day and we listened to stories and had a great time. And probably four or five years later, I'm at the NAMM show looking at something and BB uh, King is on his way with his entourage to do you know something for Gibson or somebody. And I'm looking at this widget that I'm curious about and I feel a hand on my shoulder. And I turn and it's BB King. And he looked at me and he says, Tom, right? And I was dumbfounded and I said, yes, sir. And uh, he said, we, we met at John Kick's music store. And I, I remember that day because we talked about this and talked about that. That man knew every single thing about that day. You know, years later with a guy, a kid that he had no reason to, to remember at all. So you know, there, it's, a, it's absolutely possible that I'd remember you from there. Oh, see, that's I, amazing. I feel better because at the uh, Montreal show in 2004 with Sammy Hagar, uh, I was backstage and they were doing a runner that night and they came off the stage and they walked right by me going to the vans. And I said, hey, Ed, and he went, hey, and, and they got into the van. So if I had met him again, he probably would have rem remembered me. See, probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he would have been yeah. like, "Where? I, I see. Weren't you in Montreal? Bat two seconds. Yeah, that was me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Tom, it's funny you were talking about the uh, about Ed's tuning about the. Uh, so when you, what do you call that? Like, what is that tuning style called? Like, you know, it's like fourteen cents. You know, sharp or flat. Like, is there a is there a term for that? It's it's temper tuning. Temper tuning. Okay. You're setting you're setting the temperament from one note to the next. Um, you know, in the in on guitar, it would be in the range of where the player's playing it. You know, it's it's very and, and Greg will tell you it's 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 how pianos are tuned, you know. So hmm. that's a very important part of tuning. But guitar players never pay attention to that stuff. You know? Right. Yeah, they just play it if it's in tune. If, if it's not, they say it's not in tune. Yeah. Yeah. Or we make feedback and, until we figure out what's out of tune, and, and you know, my my guitar techie he, he played in a band uh, that opened for Van Halen on the 2004 tour. They were called Jonas and the Massive Attracts, or just Jonas at the time. And I he, saw that. Yeah, yeah, you were there, and yep. he would tell me stories about you know they did like that whole first leg with them, and Ed would literally just pop his head into Corey's dressing room and be like, "Hey, want to come play some guitar?" And he's like, you know, Ed would put his guitar on me. He's like, I played the Frankenstein. He's like, you know, I played the Wolfgangs. And he's like, no matter what, he's like, whenever I'd hit it, it was always out of tune. He's like, and yep. then I realized that he was playing, you know, his high strings were all like, like slightly, slightly flat. And Ed was like, yeah, he's like, I have to play it like this or else it might, as soon as I hit a chord, it goes sharp. So he has to tune it down. So right. it's cool that you confirmed that. Well, the hey, thing about it is, is you know, 14 cents is not slightly out of tune. No, that's, that's a, that's a lot. <laughs> hey, hey, Tom, a quick step back to that. A minute ago, we were talking about Ed's recall ability. Mm -hmm. So right after he was adamant about, I, I know you, we've met. The next thing he asked me was, you got, you got some wire cutters? <laughs> and I'm kind of looking around and I'm like, oh, no, sir, I don't believe I have any here. And the next thing I know, someone hands him some wire cutters and he starts trimming his fingernails with them. And I said, sir, I've got nail clippers right here. And he's like, no, I like to cut them with the wire cutters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. Oh, dude, that's, I'm gonna have the, that's gonna be the next trick, man. Always need to have a pair of wire cutters to cut your nails. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why are you use a cutter? Let's say Van Halen does. I gotta use Eddie Van Halen. It's good enough for him. I like, I like yeah. wire cutters. Yeah. Tom, I want to talk about Ed's guitar tone a little bit, you know, on those live shows, because I got, um, 
I got three 5153s here in my house. Okay. The heads. So how stock were those 5153 heads that he was using on that 07 tour? And how did it progress to when we got to the 5153S on the 2015 tour? Well, there have been several revisions to, to those amplifiers. Um, the, the one thing that, that I think the coolest thing uh, that I can say about all of that is that the amp that you play at home is exactly the amp that Ed played on stage. Mm. There weren't, if, if there were ever modifications done, it was to address a thought or an issue that we uncovered by touring with the amps and that revision or redesign to compensate for something was always incorporated into the next series of amplifier. Um, this was a situation where, you know, the EVH brand is no longer a, it was no longer a, a PV5150 or a Music Man uh, Wolfgang guitar. This said EVH on it. And mm -hmm. Ed was absolutely adamant that what the customer paid for was exactly what he got, what he had. Mm -hmm. um, and he was, he was so he was so adamant about consistency in the product that I, I mean I'd, I'd seen him yell at guys from Fender that had, would bring something for him to check out an, an amp to check out and you know we're talking about we're talking about a guy that you know on the first tour he would look at me and and he'd have this kind of what was that look on on his face as loud as the guitar rig was and as you know ed's hearing was not that good uh, mm. but he can hear three he could hear three millivolts of bias drift during a show he'd look at me and, and with a, with an uh, with a kind of a one of those scrunched up nose looks and that was my cue to to at, at that point the first amplifiers you know you i couldn't check the bias so he had me replacing tubes between songs hmm. so my my first contribution to to that whole uh, 5150 thing um i basically insisted that dave friedman come out and we work on the amps and put the the bias test ports and the bias control on the back of the amp so hmm. that i could monitor it during the show and adjust the bias so that we could maintain a consistent, you know, bias across the tubes during the show without changing them. Wow! But you know, you come to find out, we we had a we had a large batch of tubes that that hadn't been burned in properly, um, like hundreds of them. Um, so we'd get we'd get five shows out of one set of tubes, and two shows out of another set of tubes, and ten shows out of another set of tubes, and everybody was like, "It's the amp! It's the amp!" And it's no, it's got to be the tubes. I was right. So, but the uh, you know, there there have been I don't know how many revisions there there have been you know since I started, but it's it's very important that that everybody know that that when you buy one, it's the same thing that Ed Ed got. Now mm -hmm. we set the bias a little hotter than the factory, right? Yeah, um, but I I think the factory setting is. 40 millivolts across across the quartet of tubes and i used to set them at 45 if i remember correctly nothing ridiculously out of line uh, but enough so that the amplifier really lit up like a roman candle at that point right now, did did we use more tubes that way you would think so but on the 2015 tour um on the 2015 tour i used one head with one right. set of tubes for almost the whole tour. Um, we had an issue with, we had a tube failure that they had to find with an electron microscope. Um, what? Literally, nobody could figure out what, what happened with this. See, with it. this is why arena shows sound better than bar shows because they ain't no mice microscopes at, at the brass monkey, I, you know. Well, there, there <laughs> wasn't one at the arena either. You know, I, I, I switched Ed to his back, one of his backup heads and we boxed the head up and shipped it straight to Fender. And, you know, a few days later, they, they got in touch with me and said, Tom, we, we literally 
had to put the, the tubes under an electron microscope to find the fault in one of the plates in the Jeez. power gate. Oh my God. So that's, that's the attention to detail that Ed insisted on because wow. it had his name on it. Let, let me ask you just before Jeremy gets into the whole sound thing, is working with Ed and working with CC, like, I mean, are, is it a guitar tech, a guitar tech, or is, are you working on like, you know, major league baseball and triple A, like, and not, not, not as an insult, but I mean, in terms of demands, I'm not, not, a, not about the player, but in terms of demands, like the CC disco, just make sure they're in tune and let's have some fun. Or is it also the same kind of attention to detail and, you know? Well, the, the, the thing about being a tech is right. you never you never know when an artist is going to be taken by a detail. Mm. So it's it's like Ed used to say it was consistency you know in all things, and I think that that's the most important part of being a tech is right. you have to be consistent. No, it doesn't matter who you're working for. Right. They you know the 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 biggest thing is they're creatures of habit they have a comfort zone right. they, don't, yeah. they want to go out and play they don't want to go out and think about playing so it's our job to make sure that things are the same way today that they were yesterday and the day before and the day before and to keep communication up with an artist so that if something does change you know you have to let me know because i can only work with the information that you give me if i don't get any I don't know if something's wrong. So right. feel yeah. free at all times to tap me on the shoulder and go. And let me just re rephrase that for a second too, because I wasn't trying to insult Cece that at all. But oh no, not at all. Yeah. That's not Mitch, you basically called CC like you know triple uh, Yeah, and that's not that's not what I meant yeah. at all. But but I'm just saying, is was the level of stress with Van Halen more than the level of stress with poison, or a gig is a gig and you you approach it exactly the same? I I approach it exactly the okay. same. Um, yeah. It, it was it was funny because I, I think uh, I had uh, uh, I had mentioned uh, uh, on the phone when we we, we spoke that uh, uh, at one point during the 2015 tour, Jim Service uh, came, who was Wolfgang's tech, and and a uh, you know, and I know that uh, I know Greg's been touring with him with with Foreigner. Um, he's an A level tech mm. um, and great guy. I love him to death and. Uh, he, uh, he came to my side of the stage you know, one day and, and he leans up against my work box and he says, Webb, I don't know how you do it. I said, what do you mean? He said, how do you deal with the pressure? I said, well, you know, I, don't know, I don't know what you're saying. He says, dude, it's Eddie freaking Van Halen. He said, I, I don't think I could do it. I was like, oh, come on. You know, I, I don't look at it any differently than, than working with CC or working with Rebus guys, you know. Your, your demeanor with the person may be different, but your commitment to the gig can never change. It has to be, you know, if you're gonna maintain a, rela a, a relationship with an artist and a reputation in the industry, your reputation has to precede you and it has to be maintained at all costs because you could, the last thing that you want is somebody going, I heard this guy was really great but you know he's kind of la lazy with us you know nah Not you right. can't do yeah. that this guy can't hear the shit that's going on in the tubes unless it's under a microscope come on <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's it <laughs> right, so. that's, that's crazy man i mean and, and especially you know, when you're touring with edward van halen it's like like you said you know it really comes down to consistency because obviously he does have the brand that he's representing right you know he waves the flag and says i don't put anything on unless it's been road tested you know even down to back when he put out the original music man guitar there was an interview he did where he's like you know i wanted ernie ball to have the quality control where i could be on tour in uh you know boise or i could be in um you know la London and go into a music store and grab a guitar off the rack and play it that <laughs> night he's yeah. like that's the kind of quality control that i want so to hear you reiterate that it it, it really puts you know, confidence in me as a consumer, because I know that that is true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what the last thing you want to, the last thing that you want to tour with is something that you can't get if it breaks. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is dumb. Yeah. They don't make those anymore. I can't get one and you can't do your show without it. Oops. Yeah. Hey, Sorry, Tom, back, back to what Tom was saying, uh, addressing 
the magnitude or the intensity of the Van Halen gig. Mm -hmm. Let me chime in and tell you a little story. When I got the offer to do that tour, I was a bit nervous about it because there were a lot of stories about different periods of the band, different states of mind of any members of the band at particular right. times in their history. And I was just a little nervous. So I actually called my buddy, Steve Percaro from the band Toto. Steve had worked with, well, Steve is very friendly with the Van Halens. I think most of the Toto guys are obviously. Steve had worked with Alex on the previous tour to build all the backing tracks for Alex's drum solo. Hmm. You, I don't know if you were on that tour, Tom, or not, but anyway, Steve did this really cool soundtrack that Alex did the solo to. And yeah, because so anyway, they used a couple of Toto uh, samples in that really cool like rumba track. Oh, well, really? you know, on, the, on the 2015 tour, I they were using out. Toto samples in Van Halen shows? Yeah, so during Alex's solo, oh. if you listen to like the horns and stuff like that, that was there's like a bunch of Toto stuff going on. Well, that's a that's a different story, um, and that's interesting that you picked up on that. And I'll, all right, I'll, I'll let's do up. both. Let's hear both of I these stories. Yeah. I know this stuff. <laughs> all right, <laughs> I'm gonna sit cool. back and be educated. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I've got my I've got cool my School of Rock shirt on. I'm ready to be educated. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I Kind of that just slipped my mind. But anyway, back to Steve Percaro. I called him and I said, Steve, I kind of want to get your brotherly advice. I, I'm uh, considering this amazing opportunity to go out on tour with Van Halen, but I'm a little nervous about it. What, what do you say? And he said, you'll be just fine. Just remember this. Keep your head down. Don't say anything and try not to get fired. It's a tough room. Oh, my God. <laughs> And I was, uh, you know, oh, no God. pressure, no pressure. <laughs> As it turns out, that 2015 run, the guys couldn't have been sweeter. Absolutely. I mean, I remember days I'd be sitting at my rig editing. I'd feel these hands come over my shoulders, a big bear hug its head. Um, he was absolutely lovely that summer. Uh, so it turned out wonderfully, but I was a little nervous in the beginning. Yeah. So uh, was, it exact, was it the exact opposite of what you were expecting? Like it was a love fest versus the careful? Well, you know, I took Steve's advice. I just tried to be invisible, getting back to the very beginning of the conversation yeah. and not say much. There was one day I was sitting quietly and I knew uh, Roth was, David Lee Roth was right behind me, warming up before the show. He would have this ritual where he would come up and stand right behind me just as he was about to go on at the beginning of the show. And he would do his martial arts warm-ups, right? Wow, 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 wow. The yeah, Kung Fu and, fighting, we love it. And so I would just sit and look forward and never turn to him, never try to chat with him. I would let him be the instigator, but I would <laughs> sit quietly. One day, I didn't know he was behind me and I felt this whoosh kind of breeze by the back of my head and I turned and he says don't move and I realized he's using my head as a kung fu target and the legs coming up over my shoulder and, and I was instructed <laughs> awesome. to move on that oh that's awesome uh, but anyway, before I forget so yeah we're uh I came in and uh, was working with Alex uh, a whole team of people were working with Alex to build this new soundtrack for the uh, the drum solo on the 2015 tour and Alex is very creative. He has lots of ideas that constantly kept changing and changing right up until the last minute um, with ideas. And at one point, Alex said, you know that song, that Toto song, Jake to the Bone, which is one of the most amazing Toto songs that no one, not too many people heard. Incredible instrumental song. And Alex loved it. And he said, let's put, let's see if we can put a riff from that song at the end of the drum solo. And I said, well, cool. I mean, do you have to check into the copyrights uh, for that? And he's like, well, let's see. Yeah, let's just talk to the guys. So I said, all right, let me, I'll call Steve Picaro right now. And I did. And Steve says, I've got Luke right here with me. And he's like, hey, you want to do what? And I said, Alex is interested in using this riff from Jake to the Bone. Are you cool with that? Absolutely. Use it, brother. And it was just like that. It was done and, and in the silly. Very, very cool. You picked up on that. Yeah, well, I, I was reading somewhere See? about it because I just got that new um, Modern Drummer just put out a new really cool book about and they cover like all of Alex's kits through the years and there was a new interview with him in there as well and uh, 
And I think they talked about that in there. And I was like, oh, that's a Toto song. And so that's cool. Let me ask you this. So when you go in to record, you know, those types of backing tracks with the band and then it's being played back in like live, um, because in Alex's drum solo, there's a part in there where at the end, Ed's guitar kind of comes in and he does this riff sort of like um, from Girl Gone Bad. Was that on tape or was Ed doing that live every night? No, Ed came in early one morning. Um, I remember Alex would call me every morning. Tom, this was when we were at Sony. Um, Ed would, or I'm sorry, Alex would call every morning. We would talk about the day's plan. Um, and so he called that particular morning. He said, hey, uh, let's come in early. My brother's coming in and we want to, we're going to record a guitar part for the solo. All right, cool. So sure enough, there's Ed and he's sitting on a road case right next to my computer rig to do that part. Mm. And I'll, God, that was amazing. I remember asking Ed, okay, how do you want to approach this? Do you want me to give you a two bar count in? How are you feeling the time here? Are you feeling quarter notes, eighth notes? How do you want me to count you in? He's like, and he says, I don't even want to think about counting anything. Just point at me and I'll play. <laughs> that's exactly what he did and of course one take perfect done there you go and so it was it was in the computer every night dude you engineered a recording session with edward van halen well i don't want to give myself too much credit but uh, come know, on man it was pretty darn cool. <laughs> but you did you did every night you know alex of course uh gets click track into his mm -hmm. into his in-ears and so you know that's how course you know he's in sync with with the uh, backing tracks so was he using click track on every song or no only on the songs with the drum solo and the, the keyboard songs keyboard, okay everything there else was, was um, there was an in-ear monitor mix that leaked from the 2012 tour and they were doing a couple of songs and there was like really loud cowbell like going in the background so i was always yeah, curious that's, if that's he was doing... yeah that's yeah. The click that, that al's following yeah so then um, when, you're nice. doing play, when you're doing playback for other artists and stuff, are you the guy that's going, you know, like if you're doing on Shakira and you're like, okay, here we go uh, on the playback. Do you go whenever, wherever, one, two, three, verse, or like all those things? Do, do every, you have artist, every artist is different, uh, what yeah. they want. And some tours you have slates, slate tracks in there that gives the song name un, uh, as the count off is under it. Yeah. You know, Van Halen was just very simple. It was just a cowbell and one, two, one, two, three, four, boom. And so were you recorded on the track going one, two, like it was yeah, it was all pre-recorded. Okay. Was it was it your voice or was it like Al or no, no, I inherited uh, a lot of uh, tapes, a lot of material from previous oh, okay. tours and generations. So they were comfortable with that. Don't mm -hmm. change it. Nice. That's cool. Tom, uh, here's a question I've always been curious about. So Ed's guitar tone, you know, he's, he's known as one of the guys that sort of, you know, innovated the whole wet, dry, wet setup. Okay. So when it comes to that, how, cause you've said that his, like the stage volume is super loud. Right. So how loud are his cab? So in the center, you literally have just dry. So what does that mean? What is going through that? If I turn the flanger on, is the flanger going through that cabinet? All, all the all the, the 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 pedals on the pedal board go through the center cabinet. Mm -hmm. uh, that signal uh, basically, we we'd take a uh, we had a a little black box that uh, basically boils down to like a, a Palmer load center yeah. speaker simulator type of a thing where we we didn't use the effects loop for uh the time-based uh effects the delay and and verb um mm -hmm. we, we came we came off a speaker output for that and stepped that signal down to line level right the, with that went to the input for the the uh the left and right delays and uh the the, the lexicon reverb unit and that was fed into an H and H power amp, and that became left and right. So, so talk about the like the the volume level though, because it's like you know, were the left and right speakers the same level as the dry, and it was just like a wall of yeah. sound, and then like the delay would come in. Like, how were the levels set, and like how like loud was the delay in the mix, kind of thing? 
it was maybe a, a little, it, it varied from day to day, depending on the acoustics of the room. Mm. You know, that's, that was the advantage of having, uh, you know, the, the, the power amps, basically I could turn them up, turn them down, depending on what was, what Ed was hearing on any given day. Mm. Um, but typically we really didn't have to horse with, with a whole lot of anything. It, it came up pretty close every day. Um, the left and right is very comparable to the, the, the center channel. Um, and I think the, I think the nuances of, of, uh, you know, those sounds left and right were, they were minimally different, but mm -hmm. not enough, not enough to really notice it. Uh, it was plenty loud. It's, it's was the second loudest guitar rig that I've ever played through. Well, who's so, is the loudest? Uh, Angus Young's. <laughs> wow. I, uh, I had the opportunity to play through it, uh, when I was, I was with nine inch nails and we were, I think we were in Minneapolis and they were in the venue the, the night before we were, and they invited us to come and you know, hang out for the day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I got a chance to, to, to play through Angus's rig and it, it will literally lift you up out of your shoes. Mo the wow. loudest thing that, I mean, I, I hit a chord on, on this thing standing where Angus would stand. And I literally, my brain told me that I had just taken a step to the right and I was now three inches shorter than I was a second ago. It just, it, it just, <laughs> my, it threw my equilibrium off just because it was so loud. And I spent the show sitting at front of front of house with my in-ears in as, mm -hmm. as earplugs and it was still too loud. <laughs> wow. What do you think that is? Is, he, is the guy just deaf or like is or is that contribute to the tone having those those you know cabinets just really working? Oh, it you know it's with guitar, the louder you are you are, the more magical things you can do. You know, it's it's not like any other instrument in that respect. Um, a lot of times, you know, you get feedback with a guitar, you can play it like an instrument. You know, you get feedback with a violin, it's not necessarily a good thing. You know, or vocal microphone. Nobody really wants to hear feedback in a vocal microphone, but yeah. guitar, it's fine. You know, the more yeah, the merrier. Get, so. get on the whammy bar and you don't know, start doing all kinds of cool oh, yeah. things. And... Yeah, it becomes magic at that point. The magic wand. So, yeah. Uh, oh, I got another really nerdy question for you. So you're talking about, you know, being able to tune Ed's guitar and everything. There's a lot of speculation about how low he likes his action. Could you talk <laughs> about that a little bit? Well, I think you have to take into consideration that the first rule of guitars is every single one of them is measured in thousands of inches. Mm. There's, you know, the, the geometry would dictate that the closest thing to, to the neck being parallel to the string is the least invasive on tuning as you play up the neck. Some people say, oh, I got to have, you know, this much relief in the neck. I never do. I try to, I get it as flat as I can get it. And I get the strings as close as the artist wants them. Ed's action wasn't the lowest of, of you know, the players that I've worked with, but it was by no means high. Um, mm -hmm. It's not that, there's nothing particularly tricky about getting action that's comparable to what Ed played on a daily basis. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it really wasn't that, by the time I finished working on the guitars, the, they were pretty straightforward. The, the tuning was more the difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it, was, it was really interesting. One, one day we got a prototype instrument in and- uh, Do you remember I, which one it was? Was it a Wolfgang or was it a Stripe It was a Wolfgang. Wolfgang. It was a Wolfgang. And, and of course it arrived you know, 15 minutes before sound check. And Ed wants to play it. And I was like, well, you know, it's, it doesn't have the, you know, we, we use, uh, we use titanium parts from uh, uh, FU Tone, uh, Flayed Upgrades, Adam Reaver's place. Yeah, I love Adam. Oh, yeah. He, he's the one that got me in the door with Van Halen. I really? Mean, he and Matt Brock went to school together when they were kids. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Well, Matt, Matt called, Adam, called Adam and said, you know, because Adam deals with every Floyd Rose guy there is, right? Yeah. And and Matt said, I need I need a tech. 
Um, you know, you know all the Floyd Rose guys. He said every everybody that we've we've talked to is busier. They 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 don't want the pressure of working with Ed. Well, I was just gonna say, first of all, you're busy. Get the what? Eddie Van Halen's calling you. You're not busy. Well, if you want to if you want to keep working in the business and you've got a gig, I I did a, I did a, a run with Matchbox Twenty in 2017, and three days into rehearsal. I got four calls in the same day to go to work for an artist for four times the money. Wow. And I had, com I, I turned them down four times because I had committed to doing this Matchbox 20 gig. And the guitar player found out about it. And he walked in and he, he said, he said, I understand that Steve Miller has been calling you. And I said, but yes, you, you, you understand correctly. He says, I also understand that, they offered you a lot of money and you didn't take the gig. And I, and I said, that's true. He says, have you lost your freaking mind? <laughs> he says, I'd have taken the gig. I'd have been on the airplane. I'd have left me a note. <laughs> <laughs> I would have left my own band to do this. You would have woke yeah. up the next morning. I would have been gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I told him, I said, that's, that's not how I do business. And my reputation is more valuable to me than that. And, it has to be. It just yeah. has to be. So. Do, do guys come in and out of gate? Like, do they do they leave halfway through the tour? Like, do people just cut out and go, "Hey, listen, Aerosmith called, gotta go." So, I mean, is that that that's not an industry standard. It can't be. Well, it happens. Wow. It happens. So, wow. Okay. So, is there like, a, do you have a contract with these bands, or is it just kind of like a gentleman's agreement? Oh, I'm gonna pay you a couple of G's a week. Here's our deal. And then if Joe Perry calls, you're like, I gotta go. Well, first thing I think in the music business, there's no such thing as a gentleman's agreement. <laughs> and 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 we'll we can we can leave that up to speculation as to why. But yeah. uh, you know, what is it? The, the 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 there's a famous saying about the 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 the, the music business is a, a a road to hell or whatever, then there's this and there's that, and then the, the other thing and the blah blah blah. Oh, and there's also a uh, there's also a downside, <laughs> you know. And, right. Yeah, it's that. It's that but. cutthroat industry. Yeah. But it's oh, amazing yeah. though, when you see like bands like Foreigner that have the same, a lot of the same guys come back year after. And Metallica yeah. was doing that for a while. They had the same guys. It's, it's nice that some of these bands and we'll call it loyalty, but they, some of them have the loyalty and some just change the roadies like, like car parts, you know, but right. nice to see the ones that have that loyal. And by the way, thanks for the Foreigner four behind you, Jeremy. In, in tribute there of is. Greg, that was that was very thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> Signed by Mick Jones. That's and right. Actually, hold on. There's a photo of me and Mick Jones uh, right there. There you go. Awesome. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> what nice were we tribute. talking about? We were talking about something Van Halen. I can't remember now. We were talking about action, the, action, action on guitars. Yeah. Uh, it, so, it really, it really just uh, it it it's not that tough when you start talking about guitars. The slightest change matters. So, yeah. again, consistency. Be yeah. on top of all that stuff, you know. Yeah, I remember because I, I bought my first, the reason I bought my first Wolfgang was because, well, I paid for half. I had to work at my parents' gas station, and they paid for the other half, which was awesome. And I was in grade nine, I think. I was in middle school. And uh, so we saw I saw Van Halen on that 07 tour in November of 2007 at Montreal. And he was playing one of the prototypes. It was the the Ivory Wolfgang, and the other one he was playing was the one with four on it. And um, huh, four, there you go. So I saw yeah. that, and it was the the first one that got it. Steve's music once they were officially released. Steve's music in Montreal. Saw it on the rack. I was like, that's the one I want. And in the in the case, it came with um, you know like the the pamphlet that you write the serial number on, and it came with like a little write up from Ed, you know, talking about the story of the guitar. And he said on there the act. He said on there, the action is set to the point of buzz and then it's brought back up again. And yeah. I always thought that was very interesting. So to hear the perspective of how his actual guitar set up and it's similar. So, well, you know, the, the, I've, I've never met a guitar that I really, really enjoyed that didn't rattle a little bit when you lean into it. You know, yeah. you have to be able to play. The player has to be able to, to, to play cleanly. But, you know, the, the picture of Telecaster or, you know, Telecaster is the, the, the ultimate attitude guitar. 
you lean into a Telecaster and it rattles and the, the single coil pickups pick it up and you can tell there's a little bit of anger that, that comes with that, that rattle of strings, you know? So I always try to make it so that if, if you play with a, a lighter right hand, you get the clean. If you lean into it, you get that jangle that we were looking for. But you, you, your action really doesn't have to be that low to allow that to happen. You, you, have, to, you have to play with a, a different right hand from one, you know, one emotion to the, to the next. So it's easier when the strings are lower. So, you know, I always, that's, that's pretty much correct. You know, you, you, you bring it, bring it in, bring the action in until it rattles a little too much and then you back it off until it doesn't. And that's, what's right for you. Now yeah. I try to keep the fingerboard as straight as possible because like I said, the geometry being what it is, you don't want to have to bend. You don't want to have to press a string further in the middle of the neck than you do at either end. Right. Um, you know, when you, especially when you're talking about somebody like Ed, who can hear, you know, the the temperament between strings so well, uh, you want consistency across the playing surface, uh, and a, a flat surface is pretty much as close to perfect as what you're going to get for that. So. No, that makes total sense. So to go back to Ed's tuning, how many of the strings had? the altered tuning on them like was it every single one of them or was it just like the high strings or you know was four was the 14 cents just on the g string and the b or they were all different and it would be it'd be different from one guitar to the next because oh. well and and here's why um when i first went to work for him we played uh my instructions were uh there were four guitars in the rack and then the the two little guitars, a main and a backup. Yeah. Or maybe the, there were, yeah, and then a Frankenstein. Did he have the so, Art Series guitars on that tour too? Uh, those were the ones that uh, that uh, he played and signed, and yeah. they were yeah. auctioned off. Oh yeah, I had to I had to set those all up too. They <laughs> they would meet me at every venue, and oh. uh, it's like oh yeah, we got we got five of them today. Okay, I got nothing better to do, you know. I'm, <laughs> right, I'm, right. I'm changing all of the twelve-inch speakers in the guitar rig, and and all of the pickups and all the guitars, and I have five of those things. To work and meanwhile, on. meanwhile, Greg's over here going, "I only got this button to push." Meanwhile, <laughs> Greg is like, "Is my keyboard sample rate correct tonight?" <laughs> I got this one button on, <laughs> off. <laughs> Can I off. just say though that the fear in your heart. When pressing that button, if a beach ball were to come up or an error message, right? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. It oh. had its it had its ups and downs in that chair. That must oh, be the yeah. most like oh that's well yeah. I, well, I want to know a flying the, beer. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Frank, get thinking about some stories about beach ball stories. We'll get to that in a sec because uh, <laughs> Tom, continue. There, I forgot what I was saying. That's uh, uh, art five series, guitars. Right, the art series guitars. Right, right. Well, that you know, basically, my instructions on the first tour was, you know, you've got guitar number one. Ed will never hold a guitar for more than two songs in a row because he'll pull it out of tune. So, guitar number one, then guitar number two, you know, guitar number three in certain circumstances, and guitar number four is only in there in case one, two, and three catch fire. Hmm. So, you know, there was levels of love from one guitar to the other, but we got to uh, the first. I, to, to, to put it all in perspective, my first day with Van Halen was the last day of production rehearsal. The oh. next, that day was the day of the friends and family show. So my first day on the job entailed having a show at the end of the day. And then the whole business went in the truck and we went on tour. So I was going to, I had one day to figure out what I was doing for the tour and pull it off the first time so nothing like no, no pressure here you know none at all meanwhile greg's like yep that works yeah, yeah. we're good <laughs> well greg you're shaking your head and is that kind of like industry standard like you just kind of get thrown into the trenches like that or he's just like yep we're good okay <laughs> well it was it was funny because that that uh. day the production manager said uh, you know i was in the in the production office and he said okay not to not to 
put any pressure on you or anything, but this whole tour, whether we stay out for the whole tour or we go home tomorrow, revolves around what kind of humor your guy is in on any given day. Wow. Great. Holy crap. Wow. Welcome to Van Halen, first day. Nice. But we got, uh, I had set the guitars up the way that I, I felt they needed to be. And we start the friends and family show. I haven't even heard the whole show yet because we didn't make it all the way through the show in rehearsal that morning. So we get to, you know, guitar number one, you know, song, song one, song two, and Matt's right there with me. And he says, okay, be ready with guitar number two. And I'm, I'm standing at the, at the base of the stairs with guitar number two. And Ed looks at me and he goes, I'll keep this one. Yeah. And that day we didn't make the first guitar change until 13 songs into the show when he came down for the drum solo. And that's the way it was every show from day one until the last show that we did together. And Matt, Matt, it, Matt looked at me, he says, dude, this has never happened before. He's never held a guitar for more than two songs. And we got to the lead solo and he said, okay, be ready. Cause you know, they go into ain't talking about love and the guitar is always out of tune. And this is a real sore spot for Van Halen. And they finished the guitar solo. And now he didn't jam the headstock into the show, the stage for the, that, that show or any other show except Greensboro. But they go into Ain't Talking About Love and the guitar is still in tune. And Matt's jumping up and down. He's hugging me. He says, dude, do you have any idea what you've done on your first day? He says, this is Van Halen history. The guitar's never been in tune on that song. So that was that was the start of a, of a the of history for me but we got back to that the the prototype guitar that came in mm -hmm. um and talking about the differences of, of one guitar to another the uh the uh he was looking at, at the instrument and i said you know this this doesn't have it doesn't have the the titanium locking nut it doesn't have the titanium parts in the bridge it doesn't have your strings on it you know i haven't adjusted the, the intonation no nothing mm -hmm. i i said uh, you know and this, this guitar has got a different fret on it than your main instrument. So I'm going to have to set it up differently. And he looked at me, he says, you know, it, it doesn't impress me that, that, that you can do all that stuff. He said, what impresses me is that, you know, there's a difference. And I said, well, I'll tell you, you know, you, you start out, you know, they, they'd play the intro to the show and the first three songs and the guys would sing their background parts because Dave was never there. And that would be sound check. And then they'd go on and do whatever they felt like doing. Mm. I said, you guys start. And when I get this ready, you know, I'll bring it up and, and you can play it. Well, it, it took me the intro and the first song. I had swapped out the, the, the locking nut, all of the titanium parts in the bridge, restrung the guitar, stretched it, tuned it, temper tuned it, adjusted the truss rod. And I, I walked up on stage before the beginning of the second song and I'm holding the guitar and he walks up and he goes it's done I said you're never around to see what you actually pay me for and you know and I hand him the guitar and he it, I, I, he puts it around his neck and he's he's walking away and he turns around and looks at me like he kind of shakes his head like how in the hell you know but it, it, they don't know what we do most of the time but dude that's uh, insane yeah well, well that's that's every day of, of, of being a guitar tech you know that there's mm -hmm. something insane that's going to make your day be different than every other day so be prepared for everything so hey tom you have to tell the story about the guitar picks so just a, a quick little setup mm -hmm. is we we all collect amazing memorabilia from our tours mm -hmm. and i remember one of my little treasured uh items that I received from 2015, Tom gave me a set of, I think there were five different designed picks uh, that Ed came up with for that tour. Tom gave me a set of them. But uh, I think it may have been the first or the second show of the tour, Ed was instructed never to throw the picks out into the audience again, uh, because I think he did it the first show when there was a brawl. 
Back to the whole question of tour insurance, because if somebody gets his eye punched out, the bank. Is, and by the way, I, I have my Jeremy White pick right here. Just, <laughs> uh, uh, Wait, put it closer. Put it closer. Oh, hold on. It's going to uh, disappear. Put it, put it in front of your face. In front of your face. There you go. <laughs> nice. No, but yeah, you know, the uh, Kiss, they used to hand out their uh, the, the broken guitars and they had to stop doing it because they at, at some point somebody said they're going to sue. And if some guy gets his eye punched out because they want an Eddie Van Halen pick. Well, there you yeah, go. But, is, is that really like an insurance thing or? Yeah. Uh, nice. Nice. Pick. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah. You know what? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a funny. Thing. Greg Rule. There you go. He's got a Greg Rule. But, oh, he's yeah. on mute. Oh, Greg, you're, you're, on, on, you're on mute, Greg. Look at that. That's from Chris, uh, Chris Leparage gift. It's our little business cards. Our buddy. Yeah. Our pick with the portrait. Nice. Magic. Man, we, lo we love Chris. Chris is awesome. I, there you I've go. Got a, I'm, uh, crew picks with poison are kind of a, a, a regular thing. And I've, I've got one. I can't remember what, what year. And so are the racing outfits, by the way. The poison racing oh, outfits. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. fucking classic yeah you oh wait 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 what the next time the next time we do this i'll i'll wear one of my my uh 2007 van halen jumpsuits black jumpsuit with the van yeah. halen logo embroidered across the back Sweet. dude that'd be oh, epic yeah. yeah there's there's uh i think there are there's nine of those in existence you know wow well if you have a spare i'll give you my address <laughs> There you go. How how tall are you? <laughs> I'm six one. And about yeah. I'm, yeah. Like I'm six four. So oh, oh, I'll fit it. I'll roll it up. Why not? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Tom, let oh. me let me ask you really quick because we were talking about fu tone. You know, on on Ed's guitars, because stock they obviously don't come with the with the with Adam stuff, and you can obviously upgrade it. But on right. his touring guitars, what was he using from fu tone? Was he using the titanium or the brass, or was he just using stock Wolfgangs? titanium you know the, the the titanium parts um the way that ed's guitars were set up he insisted that the that the the clamping uh the string clamps basically be as tight as you could get them mm. um he showed me how he wanted it i'd get two maybe three shows out of a clamping block before it would break wow. and i went through those things like crazy and then I thought, you know, I talked him into, into putting the, the titanium ones in and 52 shows later, I'm still on, I was still on the same set. And mm -hmm. so it's like, yeah, you know, if for no other reason, if, 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 if for no sonic reason, which by the way, there is, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a marked improvement, you know, with, with the titanium parts. Um, did Ed say okay. that, did he, he heard a sonic difference with the titanium from FU tone versus the stock stuff? Oh Yeah. Oh yeah, we you know that's why we that's why we used it. If if he wouldn't have noticed a difference, or he or if he would have insisted on using the original parts or the, the you know, that's what we would have used. But mm. there was there's a definite advantage to all of that stuff sonically, um, just the 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 ability of the parts to maintain their shape. Um, mm. You know, you don't break parts, you can keep playing guitar, and. For yeah. me, that's kind of where my world has to remain. You know, the closer I can keep it on on the lines, you know, the better yeah. off I am. So. No, that makes sense. So, what what like how many millimeters was his titanium block like on the the bridge block? Was it thirty oh, seven? Um, this is by the way why I brought Jeremy to this conversation because I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> all the gear well, the, sluts online are really like jeremy's asking him if, how big his block was <laughs> the, the, the 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 tremolo blocks we didn't change the clamping oh. blocks in the saddles we did so okay. uh i i don't recall what the i i don't want to okay. get the wrong so, number that's one of the big things that fu tone does they do the tremolo blocks they do the brass blocks they do the titanium so you that's only did the um like the locking nut like the the clamps Right. And did you do like the, did you do the, the screws as well? Oh yeah. All that on the, stuff. On the bridge. So it was like, yeah. uh, like, Oh yeah. What I swear the... by that stuff. I swear by that stuff. Yeah. And it's, we did, we did a lot of the beta testing for the titanium parts with CC DeVille. Oh, wow. Because, 
because because if if you think Ed's hard on a, on a, a Floyd Rose, CC's way way harder. Yeah, and, I saw CC last time they opened up for Def Leppard, and like, geez, the guy was like holding it like this, just from like the bar and like wiggling around. I'm like, it's gonna pop if, off. If, there, if there's a way to break a guitar, CC knows what it is. <laughs> Just don't do it on SNL. Oh yeah, my God! But, yeah, but we've we've had <laughs> we've had nothing but 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 great luck with with Adam's stuff, and and I I don't I don't leave the house without without parts from him because there I'm going to have an occasion to use something somewhere you know every time I'm out with somebody that plays a Floyd. So yeah, no, I put on all of my stuff too. So. Yeah. There so, you so you, did you use the titanium saddle blocks too on the bridge? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Everything. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Well, good to know because that's uh, yeah. everybody always talks about. They're like, I wonder if he was using titanium blocks. And it's such a Mitch. It's literally like such a minuscule, like minute thing. Like there are these small little blocks that go where like the string goes into the bridge, and people are like, I wonder if he was using that or not. You know. I know. Well, the thing about it is, it's it's not such a minute thing. No, it's not. You you can hear the difference. There's definitely a difference. Mm. You know? mm. Greg, you were going to tell a guitar pick story, but we kind of cut you off. So you keep going with that. Yeah, oh, let's get back to the guitar picks. Yeah, yeah. it was just uh, the memo came down early in the tour that, uh, Ed, please don't throw any more picks out into the audience. It incited a brawl. And it, so he agreed. And I think that's when they started to... Uh, sell the picks right tom is that how that'll happen right that is it yeah i i, I the uh i got the i got uh, kind of potentially in hot water at one point um during the uh the 07 tour because yeah. i carried all of ed's picks with me on the bus they weren't in my rig they were in my bunk in a in a uh basically small like overnight bag type of a thing did you get because, caught bootlegging picks tom well no no the the thing was you know they started showing up on ebay mm. and you know the first half of the tour we didn't have a signature pick uh, oh. it wasn't it wasn't until the second half of the tour that we got the, wait there's uh, fake stuff on ebay wow who knew oh i don't believe <laughs> well, you no, the, 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 <laughs> It wasn't it wasn't fakes, but you know, the second half of the tour, these things start right. showing up on eBay. And it's like, mm. okay, I would put, you know, a whole bunch of them out on the way it worked, there were the the the, the red, white, and black stripe picks. Were they the, the transparent uh, the transparent dunlops? Um, well, what we had was uh, the they weren't transparent. They were uh, that was I think that was the tour before I came on. They were uh, the red, white, and black stripe ones, and then uh, like a, a Herco 50 in silver, mm -hmm. which were the, the picks that he played on stage. And then we had the same thing in the gold pick, and he carried those around in his pocket, basically, so that, you know, if he wanted to hand one to somebody, the only way you were going to get a gold one was from Ed himself. From Ed him. Wow, okay. Right. Interesting. And I, I, put, I put those out on, on his mic stand so that he could use or hand out or you know do whatever pitch whatever he wanted to pitch at the time mm. and we never counted anything he said just you know line the mic stand with him and i'd always get a stage hand and I, because the first thing that anybody was going to do after a van halen show <laughs> stage hands are going to go after ed's guitar guitar picks on the on the, the mic stand so whoever i would I would pick, you know, during the, when we loaded in, I'd say, okay, come and find me before the show's over. And then when they would come and find me and let me know they were there, I said, okay, the first thing that you do when the lights go off at the end of the show, you go up on that stage and you bring me Ed's guitar or Ed's microphone stand with all the picks attached. Don't let anybody take them. And I'll take care of you guitar picks wise, you know, from there. Right. Well, at one point, it was brought to my attention that management was seeing these things being sold on eBay for three, four, five, six hundred dollars a piece. And where are these guitar picks coming from? Because there are obviously 
the, the person that's selling them has multiples of them. Mm. It's like, okay, I don't know what's going on here because I carry Ed's picks with me like a little old lady carrying her purse, you know, <laughs> in the hood. Coming out of bingo with your winnings. Yeah, you know. <laughs> well, one, one, this, this goes on and, and I'm kind of suspect here. You know, this isn't good. I don't like yeah. this at all. I'm, I'm not happy about this. And uh, one day I'm sitting at dinner and catering and one of the video guys comes up to me and he says, I know where your guitar picks are going. Really? He said, yeah, we, we used to strike all the microphone stands to the drum riser. And then there was a big scrim cloth that, that covered the, the drum riser. And then at the beginning of the show, that would go straight up in the air. Mm. But all of the, all the microphone stands with all the picks on them would go on the drum riser and then the scrim would come down. Oh, well, the video guy informed me that nobody knew it, but that day he had installed a video camera pointing straight down at the drum set. And one of, one of the guys on the crew was waiting for everybody to go to dinner and then he'd sneak up there and, and take guitar picks off of ed's mic stand son of a bitch yep and i i found him right after dinner i said okay i know what's going on and if you don't want to go home tonight you stop because you're going to cost me my job and i'm not having it dude yeah. I'm sorry you know I, I i i i didn't i didn't mean any harm i was like yeah well you're making you're making twelve eighteen hundred dollars a week more than the rest of everybody in your department by selling ed's guitar picks yeah wow. you know, insider so trading that's damn. that is so much goss and drama so why was, is he not fired on the spot honestly like, that, why is he not fired on the spot because i just didn't think that it was that big a deal okay you know? and so, also the, the the tour is so big that to bring somebody else in becomes a, a bigger pain in the ass I didn't want to get, I didn't want that. I didn't want it to, to, I didn't want to beat that guy. You know, I would rather yeah. address the issue myself and say, okay, you have one chance to correct this. And if you don't, then. Right. And as a bonus, you can hold it over his head for the rest of the tour over his head. I should say not over his head. Say, Hey, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, a little blackmail yeah. never hurts. Yeah. What, the, yeah. what does Ed do when uh, he gets, you know, when you go into the dressing room and say, Ed, listen, we just got told by production, you got to stop throwing guitar picks out into the crowd. Does he say, well, I'm Eddie Van Halen. I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want. Like, you know, how does, how does, how does, he, how does he react to that? I don't, I don't, I would have no idea because that wouldn't come from me. That oh, would okay. come from his personal manager. You know, I'd, my, my <laughs> job with, my job with an artist is to make sure that they're happy when they walk on the stage and, or if they're happy when they walk on the stage, that they stay that way. If they're not happy when they walk on the stage, that they're happy when they walk back off. You That's know? a question for Marty Hom to answer there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Tom, was it you or Jim Service who used to super glue Ed picks down on the uh, the floor or on your case for stagehands to try to <laughs> try to pick up? That probably would have been Jim. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. But that sounds that sounds like beef. A lot of good <laughs> entertainment watching. That's that. hilarious. <laughs> absolutely absolutely <laughs> that's great i forgot about that here's I another that. here's another really stupid nerdy question i know we're coming up to two hours and guys thanks so much for doing this like this is this yeah. a blast this is fun right right we can do this for days yeah, yeah. Look, this is this, this, this is episode one yeah episode that's what one. i'm thinking yeah two yeah. hours of episode one and then we'll, we'll keep going and uh, yeah yeah, so right. if we get if we get Jim Service and John Douglas in on this, this could go for weeks. Oh, we it's should do that. We'll do so the Van Halen cool. Van Halen special. You know, 2015 Absolutely. reunion. I'm in. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Uh, Tom, here's a here's a really stupid question, and I okay. So on that 07 tour, Ed was using a cable, and then he switched to wireless. Correct. What was the deal with that cable and then eventually going to into wireless because that thing it just seemed like it was giving him nothing but problems on stage yeah those and that that brings up another great another great story see mitch it's a good thing you brought me here tonight we're getting great yeah. stories <laughs> yeah 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 we're good yeah, yeah. these That's things the were, were these things were my every day 
You know, yeah. I didn't give it a second thought because this is my day, you know? Yeah. But for um, us fans, us weirdos, we're like, oh, cable, you know? Yeah. Those, those cables were, I was instructed that those cables were to be 43 feet long, no longer, no shorter. Oh, and yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's, it's EVH cable, you know, the same thing that you would, you would buy. Okay. And then from, I think it was, there was a supplier in Chicago. You, you, you noticed that the, 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 uh, the cables had yellow stripes. Yeah, it, it was yellow and black. Right. Well, it's, it's basically a black cable with yellow shrink tube on it. They call okay. that the striper cable, by the way. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. But I, I, had to, I, I replaced those cables every three shows. So you can imagine how many of them I ended up having to make at 43 feet long and putting each piece of shrink tubing on from one end all, all the way to, you know, from one end to the other, six inches of yellow, six inches of black, six inches of yellow, six oh inches of black. Oh my God. Now, yeah, it's a lot. Of, it was a lot of work on top of what I normally did every day. But I got to a point in the tour where I called, uh, I'm, I'm thinking the company was Gepco in Chicago. And uh, I'm ordering more yellow shrink tubing. Mm. They're out of yellow shrink tubing. <laughs> All they had, you know, the closest they could give me was white. So I order a, a roll of white. Mm. So I made, I, I, I had to tell, I had to tell, tell Ed, I said, I couldn't get yellow shrink tube. I had to go with white. Um, and okay, you know, we'll, we'll go ahead and make cables. Well, the first the first night with the the white shrink tubing at, at the end of the show, and I'm not sure if he was serious or not. He come he came off the stage, and he said, "You still got the you still got the the, the cables with the yellow stripes on them." I said, "Yeah, I've got I've got some of the old ones." He said, "They're fine, right?" I said, "Yeah." He he said, "I think they sound better." <laughs> and of course, I'm not going to say anything other than all right sir i'll take care of it you know because i'm not going to i'm not going to look at look at him and go seriously because and and he probably laughed all the way to the dressing room thinking he thinks yeah. i'm serious yeah but, do you think he was fucking with you or was he like you know who knows sound... <laughs> you know you, you you never know when to take an artist seriously when something sounds really outlandish yeah and 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 ed had i remember on the 2015 tour we were doing line check one day and i'm standing that's for the folks that don't don't know what line check is that's when the techs tech the chest check the instruments for the audio guys to make sure everything's working before sound check right um you don't want to be finding a problem when the artist goes to play the instrument the first time and I'm playing Ed's guitar and I'm, I'm on channel two of the 5150 head and that's his signature distortion sound. Here we go. And I'm playing along and it sounds great. And all of a sudden it switches to the clean channel. I was like, um, well, that's interesting. So I look down and I, I hit the foot pedal to chant back to channel two and I keep playing and all of a sudden it switches to the clean channel. I was like, oh man. Ed's going to be here in 20 minutes, and this is the last thing I need. This rig has performed flawlessly, and now I've got some bug that I've got to troubleshoot or change him out to the backup head and tell him he's playing the number two head today. And I'm just really not looking forward to the rest of my day. And out of the corner of my eye, I see something moving. And I turn over, to, uh, I turn towards my workbox, and he's crouched down behind it peeking around the corner laughing his ass off he's back there <laughs> switching the, the, the amp you know screwing with me and it's just like oh man you know and right now the one thing that i wish more than anything else is that he just poke his head around the corner and say gotcha <laughs> I'd, I'd i'd give anything i own for that so yeah oh that's just so amazing oh what a great story well 
what a man lots of, great, lots of great stories that's why we need a part two and a part three and a part four and yeah. and by the way not just van halen we got to i'm interested in how different is the whole setup between a reba mcintyre and like just in terms of a country artist versus a rock artist is it just a guitar is a guitar and you off you go or is it a whole different mindset is that a whole different you know so there's a lot of stuff to explore and and of course uh, Bob Seeger and who, who else? Who else have you done, Tom? And I'll, Greg, Greg, I want to ask you too. Who, like, what are some of like, you know, the the top three that are? I mean, you know, over here we got Eagles and Van Halen and Foreigner. I mean, that, thank you. I'm done. That's, and Shakira. That's, Greg was on with Shakira. Oh, Greg did Shakira too. Yeah, oh, I miss. I missed that. Oh, well, there. Mm-hmm. With Brian Ray, who played guitar in her albums. Uh, but but Tom, who who are the like the that sort of like the top five that we just go? Oh fuck. Okay. Well, when it comes to, see, I, I started out as an audio guy. Mm. So, you know, it was, I was audio crew for, uh, I've done shows with Bob Seeger, um, Ted Nugent, Ronnie Montrose, uh, you know, for, I didn't become, I didn't become a guitar technician until wow. 94. Oh. Uh, my first I, I was I, I had I had come off the road. Um, I literally I, I had gotten a call from a country artist named John Barry, who was one of my favorite people. He wanted me to go out, and my my son had come into the world, you know, a couple of years earlier, and I had missed a lot, and I decided to come home. And John called, and he wanted me to go on the road with him, and I had turned him down, and I got a call to do a, a run with Deep Purple. And I turned that down and, you know, I stayed home and I put the guitar shop together and uh, I had some, I had some guys working for me and I got a a voicemail message for, uh, from the production manager for a band called Blessed Union of Souls, which was a a pop band in the the early mid nineties. And they're out of Cincinnati. And the, the voicemail was basically, you know, we're looking for a guitar tech, um, you know, wonder if you know anybody. And uh, I called him back and I got his voicemail and I said, you know, Scotty, I said, you know, give me the particulars. I might be interested. I'd never given one thought, uh, you know, as an audio guy, I never gave one thought, even being a guitar maker to doing backline. Right. Uh, yeah. Never crossed my mind. And, uh, and I thought, I bet I could do that. And he called me back about an hour later. and He says, dude, I never thought we'd get you. He said, it doesn't pay enough. He said, let me, let me call the guitar player and see if, if he's okay with me calling the record label and getting more tour support. And let me see if I can put together a budget that's worth you know, having you come out. And he called me about an hour later and he, he said, dude, guitar player's ecstatic. The record label's with it. You know, I can pay you this much a week. And that was the beginning of that. And I went from, <clears throat> I went from Blessed Union of Souls to Ronnie James Dio to Poison to Bill wow. Corgan. Um, wow. there's really not a long list of people that I've done guitars for because I go back, um, mm-hmm. you know, nine inch nails, Reba, Van Halen, uh, you know, matchbox 20. That's pretty much the long list for me. Wow. That's and funny. I must, I, you must've been on the tours. Cause I, I saw Ted Nugent like in 79, 80. So if you were way, way back then, I, I must've seen I stuff was, that you were doing. I might have been running around somewhere. So yeah, intensities in ten cities, right? Recorded in Montreal. So there you go. Yeah. Greg, it's what about you? Who have you who have you been on the tour, like on the road with, like aside from the ones that we've already mentioned? Oh, um, some of the American Idol kids and nice. I did this three years with. Uh, it was a Michael Jackson Cirque du Soleil thing after Michael died. I saw that. I went to the premiere at the Bell Center in Montreal. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I lived in Montreal most of that summer. That was an, oh. an intense show, intense production. And a great city. So you must have had a great summer. Yeah. I shame you didn't know us the, then. I know. Yeah. I learned all about the Putsin. Putsin. He said it right, Mitch. He's a certified I, Montreal. You know what? You're an yeah. honorary Montrealer for saying it right. You said it right. I like it. The Schwartz's. The Schwartz's Deli. Yeah. 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 See? 
But uh, and hold on, sorry. Mitch. Let me uh, let me just ask one more, you know, Van Halen thing before we kind of wrap up because we're coming up to two hours here. And so, sure. the 2015 tour, obviously, it was in support of Tokyo Dome live in concert. Now everybody talks about the sound of that album, and it almost sounds like as if it was like a bootleg, in a way, because of the way that it was mixed in post. And I went to two shows on the uh, the 2012 tour when they did that tour. And whoever was doing front of house did a freaking phenomenal job. Like it, it sounded so good. Like Al's drums just sounded monstrous and like the compression and like his snare and everything. Just like, it was just so well done and Ed's guitars and knowing as a fan, what Van Halen sounds like live. And then when I put that album on, when it came out or when the first single it almost sounded like an audience recording. It sounded so weird. You know, why do you guys think that that album sounds the way it does versus what we get every night or even board tapes that have, you know, leaked on YouTube from that tour? So, uh -oh. I'm going to let Greg go first on that one. <laughs> no, uh -oh. I, I, I really don't have an answer for that. I, all I can say is Greg Price mix, mixes Van, mixed Van Halen and phenomenal. Mm, absolutely. Uh, as for the Tokyo thing, yeah, I'll, I'll defer to others on that. Oh, I, I hear plead the fifth going on here. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, good, the good part for me is that I wasn't on that tour in, in 2012. I was working with Reba making a ridiculous amount of money and we oh. had we had we had 14 months worth of work booked and I was already doing it when that tour came into to being so okay I, did, I didn't make that one but it was really kind of it was kind of funny because I was on my way home um, in 2015 from doing a one-off with Reba and or, and uh, I'm running to catch an airplane uh, in Dallas uh, Fort Worth airport mm -hmm. and I got a I got a text message from Adam, Adam Reaver, and it just said, having a nice day. And I'm thinking, I'm running to catch an airplane. I'm, I don't know. I guess I'm having a nice day. I'll call him later. You know, I didn't return the message or anything. Right. Just put my, you know, my, just put the phone back in the, the pouch and I'm hustling to my airplane. And a, a, a few seconds later, my phone rings. And I didn't, I didn't stop to look and see who it was. I just picked it up and said, hello. And I hear, Tom, guess who? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's Ed. Van Halen. <laughs> <laughs> I know who it is. I said, what can I do for you, sir? He said, well, yeah, I just, I, I just, we're, we're, we're putting a little tour together. And he said, I just want to know. I just wanted to, 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 to see if you'd come back to work for me. I said, he said, I'm not near as, as, as much of an asshole as I was last time. He says, you know, now that I'm clean and sober, he said, uh, it'll be a lot more fun. I said, yes. I said, you know, I've, I've never had a problem, but I'd be more than happy to give it a shot with a new guy. You know, <laughs> you good? great. He says, you know, I'll have management call you and, and, and we'll get everything set up. Awesome. I said, I'm running to catch an airplane. So I'll, I'll talk to you real soon. And of course, I hang up the phone, and now Adam's text of having a nice day, you know, makes sense. Right. And they literally had to like put weights on me to get me through the door of the airplane because I'm I'm walking three feet off the ground, you know, yeah. at that point. It's like, holy crap. Ed Van Halen called me to ask him, ask me to come back to work for him, you know, personally. Like, yeah. Damn. <laughs> That's the best. That that definitely gets the double. Yeah. That's oh yeah. 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 Well, and I heard I heard um, they were sitting uh, Ed and Matt and Adam were sitting together and the question came up, you know, who should we have, you know, tech for Ed? And and Matt basically jumped right in and said, Well, Tom Weber should come back. Uh, you know, he deserves to come back. And uh, and Adam says, "Well, I've, I've got his I've got his number right here. You want me to call him?" And Ed, Ed uh, Adam told me that Ed said, "Nah, I'll, I'll call him myself." And I thought, "How cool is that?" You know. So that's just awesome. 
I felt really good that day, and I feel I feel just as good today, you know, telling the story as I as I did getting the phone call. So, mm. and how cool was this today? It's all very cool. Absolutely, awesome. absolutely. There's there's never a bad t- day to tell Van Halen stories. No, nope. no, nope. nope. Every day is Van Halen Appreciation Day in this house. Yep. <laughs> and I'll, I'll I'll add in Foreigner Appreciation Day. It's a big 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 band for me. So yeah, double oh, my, nope. look at that. Too. Double Doink, yeah. Yeah. Oh. two classic bands. And by the way, Foreigner, Foreigner need to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm sorry. I mean, we yeah. they just uh, you look at some of the bands that they that they're putting in this year, and you go, listen, they had two albums or three albums. Foreigner have had the, you know, that's uh, another yeah. discussion. Over yeah. eighty million, yeah, gold, etc. Yeah. And their first five albums, for those who don't remember, were top five on Billboard's. Uh, hot 100 so the first five the first five in the top not top 10 not top 20 top five first five albums are top five no yeah. you know, they didn't influence anybody no, nobody knows who they are oh, sure. yeah sure right before we wrap up i just got one more question for greg yeah because tom talked at the beginning that you know you had to invest in this whole brand new touring kit and brand new tools and work boxes and everything when it comes to you and the technology that you bring to a tour, do you have to supply the computers and all that stuff, or is it given to you from the tour? Well, the Van Halen rig, I, I put together from scratch. Now, do uh, you have to pay for that, and it's yours, or is it the tours? Correct. It's mine. Uh, however, other every everything's different. With the Eagles, I walked into a pre-existing rig mm. and used that for a few years and then slowly started to customize or change things, make it more comfortable. But... Yeah, more often than not, it's your own investment, your own tools of the trade, and very mm. expensive. Yeah, because I mean, you know, if you have to spend fifty grand on a kit, well, I mean, okay, you own it, but at the same time, it's like, well, shit, I hope I can pay this off. Like, is the case like as the case in Tom? You know, it's crazy. Well, I'll tell you what, though, I, I've been thrown into a few tours. Someone leaves midstream, gets fired, has to health reasons, whatever. And it can be very unpleasant when you jump into uh, someone else's system. So, mm-hmm. play, speaking of playback rigs, uh, I remember one MD said to me, you can use our rig, or if you want to bring your own in, you're perfectly welcome to do that. Uh, and I'll never forget the words, better you swing with your own sword. And right. that's, that's what I've chosen. That's what I tell my wife every night. <laughs> <laughs> What uh, what program do you use for playback live? Is it Pro Tools or are you running virtual DJ? Like, how does that work? Well, I've been a, a Motu digital performer guy for pretty much my whole career. I owe that to Mike McKnight, who got me really. I was with Keyboard Magazine for 15 years before I got on the road. Mm. I knew Mike through Keyboard Magazine and he brought me in. He's a Motu guy. I, I was a Pro Tools guy before that. I learned it. It's solid. It, many I, I won't bore you with it now but that's what i used on the van halen tour pretty much every eagles every big tour i've done has been with uh motu with motu so then does, does that come out multi-track and then at the at the monitor console you know jerry can you know if, if al wants cowbell it, like it's all multi-track and then he has the options that is correct it's yeah a lot of channels right. coming out yeah right so then when it goes to house in front of house you know he doesn't get you know like the click track or the the cues and stuff that's a thing Okay, cool. Very cool. There was one more thing I was going to ask you about that. Um, damn, I forget now. It was about uh, playback. Well, we, um, we can, uh, we, we, we can try to save it for the next time. But uh, I'll, I'll just I'll end with one quick story. Uh, yeah. Al, Al and yeah. I had this little cue worked out to start his drum solo. He would freestyle for a minute. And when he was ready to hear the count off from me, he would nod. And usually it was great. I could always see the obvious nod and off we went. One night, he he didn't nod. And I just, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And he's going extra long and I'm thinking, well, okay, this is unusual. I'm just going to hang tight and wait for the nod, which never came. Hmm. Finally, he (laughs) looks over like, you know, what the hell? 
Oh, and I start the thing. So we talked about it the next day. And he's like, yeah, I was nodding. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I, did. I didn't see you nod. But it was kind of cool because he improvised longer than ever. And I, I loved it. Right. <laughs> Tom or Greg, do either of you have any like board tapes from that tour? No. No. no, you didn't take anything no. home with you, like as memory or souvenir, like nothing on a hard drive and you slap it on. No, Greg, Greg Price recorded every show. Uh, so he's the keeper of that or he right. and. But I'm know. sure management keeps a, a tight lid on that where you got to catalog everything. Oh, and you, Right. Yeah. They, yeah. Because oh, yeah. they, they don't want no no bootlegs running around. That no. is correct. Right. Mm. Nice. I can't remember my question now, but anyways. Well, well, we just we need to get the phone number of that guy that has all the tapes. That's that's, that's what we. Yeah, need. we got to get Greg Price on here. Talk about how he EQs and compresses <laughs> Alex's snare sound. Do either of you know anything about Alex's snare sound? By the way, there's some great stuff on YouTube you can watch about yeah. that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, it's that's a about- that, that's that's a good ex- good excuse to get John Douglas on the show as well. Yeah, let's yeah. bring him on. Let's go. Yeah, but he's super cryptic, too, about it. Like, whenever he does interviews, like, oh, it's just Al, and he's got his thing. I'm like, no, no, it's way deeper than that. Come on now. <laughs> it's all right. Bring him on. We'll, we'll crack that nut. We're good at this stuff. Before we wrap up, I just want to go back to Ed's tone really quickly. When you would hear Van Halen live, you know, how much of the wet signal is going through the PA versus the dry? And does Ed tell, you know, Greg, hey, I want this and that's it? Or does, is he allowed to, you know, artistically decide, okay, I'm going to have the wet and, you know? Well, I think that, that I think that Greg, Greg Price, I think Greg Price was given a lot more leeway than a lot of engineers might have been given mm. because of his reputation and his ability to, to mix a, a band to its fullest potential. Yeah. Um, there are, you know, with any band, there are parameters that, that are to be lived within. And Van Halen would be no exception. You know, Ed would be, Ed's the first guy to walk off the stage and walk out to front of house to let somebody know if he's not happy about something. Mm-hmm. And we didn't see a lot of that, you know, with, the, with Greg Price at, at the helm. There, there's not a, there wasn't a need for it. Mm-hmm. But I think that, you know, and I, I'd been out front and Ed's tone was Ed's tone, even at front of house. You know, I had no complaints. Ed had no complaints. So mm-hmm. it just, uh, you know, pri- pricey got to be pricey and, and, uh, and everybody was all the better for it. So I just thought of something. Okay. So you were on the 2000. It's going to be the three hour, uh, the three I, hour I episode. I, I just thought of something talking about front of house. Oh, this is great. Okay. So the infamous monitor throwing video. <laughs> okay. what happened well ed was having a tough time hearing what was going on and he i think i'm not sure if he had an ear infection at the time but something was hampering his his ability to to keep with al um he wasn't hearing drums the way that he needed to mm. so you'll notice in that video he was playing very close to the the drum riser yeah and he had had Jerry put together, uh, 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 he had Jerry put a, a, a wedge somewhat behind him. Okay. And he turned his head to look at Al or to look at me. I think it was to look at Al. And that turning of his head changed you know, the alignment of the microphone with the speaker behind him. And create the feedback that that actually um, ruptured his eardrum. Oh, and that's where that whole thing came from. It wasn't anything that the that that Jerry did. It was you know Ed. They, he wanted that thing loud, and they 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 got it loud, and he just turned his head just right, and it fed back. Um, just because of the the physical environment changed with the angle of his head, and it hurt him. And that's when he took the monitor and threw it off the stage. And Shit. I think, you know, it, they talked it out after the show. And it's like, dude, I didn't change anything. You know, you when you turned your head, it must have just set it off. And they were fine, you know. But I was glad he wasn't throwing the monitor at me. So. 
<laughs> which is good because that's who i thought of because everybody talks about it online They're like oh i wonder what his guitar tech did or whatever and you all got the blame nothing <laughs> I ain't doing nothing. that's good oh, man that's awesome there yeah. you go well hold on hold on once one more thing just to go back See, to- by the way you know he's 26 years old because the rest of us our shoulders and back is are starting to seize at least mine is <laughs> and yet this guy is still right i'm just but like I- oh i I need a massage, but yeah, keep going, young kid. We'll we'll just sit here while our backs cr- crank. Uh, One crank. more thing, just to go back to our talk about the whole the cable thing. So right. you said his his cable was specifically forty three feet long. Yep. Do you know why? Nope. It was just <laughs> that was his number. That was the- there. I don't know that there was a reason for it, but superstition. We'll say there yeah. you go. And then, oh, yeah. and then why, and then why did he switch over to wireless? He was just tired of using the cable, or was there a tone reason? Well, there was. They had no more yellow wrap. Well, yeah, there's that. You know, the, the, no, the Mitch, cable, there's, there's a difference. The, the cable was definitely an issue, and you know, the scariest part about about that whole uh, situation was um, Ed went to wireless and in ears on the same day oh so, oh yeah oh that's exactly how i thought about it but i had i had uh i i talked him into trying wireless between matt brook and myself we had we had told him that you know wireless has come so far and the tone for for guitar is going to be as accurate as you're going to get and there'll be no more cable you know mm-hmm. for you to trip on or you know get wound up in, in, in pedals uh, it, it was just uh, yeah. going to be easier. Let's let's try it. So he tried the he tried everything at Soundcheck, and uh, you know had new in ears made. And Jerry brought him some you know new set of Layla's and and uh, made for him, and and they got a mix together at Soundcheck. And you know I was sweating bullets for that show because it's like wow. man, <clears throat> this is the common. This could be the perfect storm of holy crap! I don't ever want to have a day like that again. Right. And uh, they played the show. And you know, the reason for in ears was that you know the monitor rig for Dave in in the on the 2015 tour evolved into um, an onstage PA. I mean, there were wedges and side fills, and if you if you look at some of the the the, the video, um, I'm not sure when it came into play. There were literally full range PA hangs on either side of the stage. Yes, that's right. Range. I do remember. Yeah, pointing at the stage. Yeah, and there it was, was like there was like line loud. arrays. Yeah, it was so loud that you couldn't hear Ed's guitar. And that's when Ed finally switched to in ears. Yep. So he could hear himself and be and be not you know the the, the important thing about in ears and and I'm I'm sure Greg will, will back me up on this. It's great to be able to have a monitor mix, but it's also equally important to shelter yourself from what's going on on stage like that with in-ears you can you can you've got earplugs in if you turn if you turn your feet off you've got earplugs so you can bring in what you need and protect yourself from what is potentially harmful at the same time and that's the feeling you know that we 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 got from ed was that i need to be able to hear myself accurately but I need to get myself, there's no place on this stage for me to hide from Dave's vocal. And I can't hear my own guitar. I mean, to be fair, there was nowhere for anybody in the arena to hide from it either, so. No, no, there's that. (laughs) (laughs) Though it's funny, Mitch and I, we went to see Kiss and David Lee Roth open, and I noticed that about the stage. He had full PA, like as if he would like, like a wedding DJ setup, like subs and tops on both sides. I'm like, there's a full PA on the stage so it had to be loud oh yeah yeah Yeah, that's a whole other whole other story (laughs) well I I have to go I gotta go guys let's let's wrap it up thank you Greg for joining us thank you Tom and uh there we go we we will do more on it because there's there's a lot of great stories a lot of great stories I just I just want to say thank you to to you guys for for bringing Greg in. I haven't seen him in forever. I love him to death. I wish we could tour again. Um, I I I want to I want to say 
uh, I want to say thank you to Sandy Espinoza, who is the, the lady who put the GoFundMe together for me and her program, which is called roadiecare.com. Mm -hmm. um, everybody check that out. Um, she's working really hard to, to make sure that the people that are close to falling through the cracks, you know, have something to, to, to look forward to. Um, so all of that fun stuff, if you guys would do me a favor and, and look that up. And if there's any way that you can, you know, toss it out there for people to see and hear about. Absolutely. 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 It's easy. It's going up everywhere as soon as this is done. Right. Outstanding. She's, she's literally trying to save people's lives at this point. And yeah. God bless yeah. her. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's do it again. Anytime you want to let me know. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. This was awesome. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. This, this is great. This is super yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Normally we throw the guests off after 20 minutes, but look at that. We kept it yeah. for two hours yeah. and 20 minutes. There you go. You guys are there stars. <laughs> thank you, gentlemen. All right. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Greg. Thank you guys. Yeah, it was great. Cheers. Take care. All right. Cheers.